हे गाइस गुड इवनिंग कैन यू सी इन हेयर मी हैप्पी न्यू ईयर Hi everyone happy new year Yeah I am in Delhi yes that's the reason why I'm wearing this do you think I'll be wearing something like this in Chennai I don't think so not possible thank you so much dr prakash Why in Delhi? I came here to attend war, Arun. Jan one and two. It was my lectures, no? In war, that's right. Okay, guys, thank you so much. Let us start the session uh, without wasting much time. I think we have around eight hours time today, so we'll try to complete whatever possible in the next twelve, in the next eight hours. So let us start. first thing so i mean i'm going to take topic wise uh, discussion like don't worry so at the end of the day you'll be like knowing as much as possible no need to worry much so i'm going to going to cover the stuff that is asked by nb national board of examination nothing else so the same paper i mean same examination exam examination board is going to set papers for your neat pg as well as for fmg so the only difference i tend to tell the same thing right so the only difference between fmg and neat pg is the fact that fmg is a qualification exam neat pg is a competitive exam that's the only difference apart from that the question style is going to be the same there's no much difference uh, when it comes to question style and in the last 2 3 years what i'm seeing is the fmg papers are a notch tougher as well compared to the neat pg and for some reason the questions have been tough in the last 2 3 years so we have to discuss what's exactly required and that's what we're going to do let us start with the session so first let me finish off the most important areas that is the arrhythmias yeah arrhythmias so first we'll finish off the tachyarrhythmias then we'll move on to the bradyarrhythmias so when it comes to tachyarrhythmias there are two important areas that we need to cover one is the narrow complex tachycardias and second is the wide complex tachycardias you all know what do you mean by narrow complex tachycardias narrow complex tachycardias means uh, your qrs width should be less than 0.12 seconds or we can say less than three small boxes if it's a wide complex tachycardia the qrs width is going to be more than or equal to 0.12 seconds in adults or more than three small squares that's the major difference between narrow qrs and wide qrs when it comes to narrow qrs you have five important differential diagnoses in exam there can be other uh, ecgs that can be asked in exam but these five are going to be the most important so first one if you look at this you are having a nice qrs nice p and the qrs and p is in the ratio of 1 is to 1 right can you hear me yeah all good okay so the qrs and p is in the ratio of 1 is to 1 so that's the reason why we are going to call this as something called as sinus tachycardia so it's basically nothing but a sinus <coughs> tachycardia just hold on
One second. This is fine now, right? So we are going to have a P and Q R S in the ratio of one is to one. So that's why we're going to call it as something called as sinus tachycardia, right? So next we have the second rhythm. So the second rhythm is irregular. So this is a kind of irregularly irregular rhythm. So that's what is happening. So whenever you see an irregular rhythm in exam, 99.9% .9 of the times, it's going to be atrial fibrillation. But how will you confirm that the rhythm is irregular? How will you confirm that the rhythm is irregular? I mean, how will you confirm it's an atrial fibrillation? You're going to see the P waves. Look for the P waves. And of course, you're not going to have P waves. Whenever you have an irregular rhythm, and if you do not have P waves, this confirms that you're dealing with a case of atrial fibrillation. As simple as that. And here is the third rhythm. Here, you're seeing QRS. You're seeing T wave, but you're not having any P wave. Plus, at the same time, the rhythm is regular as well. The rhythm is regular. You're having QRS, you're having T, but you're not having P wave. I'm not able to see P wave. Where is the P wave? All I'm seeing is only QRS and T, right? So if you see this kind of a regular rhythm with like invisible P waves, I can say this is an example of a PSVT. That is paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. So there are two arrhythmias that come under paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia. That is AVNRT or AV nodal reentrant tachycardia and AVRT. That is atrioventricular reentrant tachycardia. Okay, but this is not that important for you. So what you need to know is this is what we typically call as paroxysmal supraventricular tachycardia or PSVT. And you all know that AVRT is something that's going to occur in Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. So signature arrhythmia of Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome is basically AVRT or atrioventricular reciprocating tachycardia. And this is a classic rhythm again. It's a spotter. If you're going to see this kind of sawtooth pattern, if you're going to see this kind of unstable baseline, and if you're going to see this kind of sawtooth pattern, this is very likely to be an atrial flutter. So this is a spotter. You cannot miss this out in exam. It's just an atrial flutter. And if you look at this rhythm, uh, here the rhythm is irregular. I told you whenever the rhythm is irregular, there is a 99% chance in exam that you're going to deal with atrial fibrillation. So here the rhythm is irregular for sure. But what you're noticing is there is a P wave. So whenever the rhythm is irregular and if you're having a P wave, it is not atrial fibrillation. Then you should have a suspicion of something else. Most likely, it will be a multifocal atrial tachycardia in exam. And how will you confirm it's a multifocal atrial tachycardia? Look at the morphology of the P wave. If you look at the morphology of the P wave, each and every P wave looks very different from each other. By definition, if you have at least three or more P wave morphologies, this is what we call it as multifocal atrial tachycardia. So the five important tachycardias are done now. So normal P, normal QRS, one is to one ratio, sinus tachycardia. Irregular rhythm, absent P wave, atrial fibrillation. And if you have a QRST with an invisible P in a regular rhythm, it is a PSVT. If you have a fluttering pattern, sawtooth appearance, it is atrial flutter. In case, if you're going to have an irregular rhythm with a P wave, it's likely to be multifocal atrial tachycardia, but confirm it by seeing more than equal to three P wave morphologies. Now coming to the two most important white complex tachycardias. Whenever it comes to exam, if you have a white complex tachycardia, it is likely to be a ventricular tachycardia unless proved otherwise. I told you so many times, at an undergrad level, usually they won't ask SVT with aberrancies. Whenever you see a white complex tachycardia, take it as ventricular tachycardia unless proved otherwise. The only thing is, you need to know whether you are seeing a regular and a monomorphic rhythm or an irregular and a polymorphic rhythm. So here you can notice that the rhythm is regular. And every single complex looks the same. Every single complex looks the same. So that's why I can say it's a regular monomorphic rhythm. So it is a monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. Or otherwise called as MMVT. Monomorphic ventricular tachycardia. Here you can notice that the rhythm is quite irregular. It's not very regular. But the complexes are also looking very different from each other. Right? So each and every complex is different. 
so that's why this is a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia in case if it's associated with long qt this is also called as torsadi point tdp so this is basically a polymorphic ventricular tachycardia but if it's associated with long qt this will be also called as torsadi point or torsadi t point is in whatever way you want to call so there are only two important white complex tachycardias one is monomorphic vt second is polymorphic vt or torsadi so we have discussed five narrow complex tachycardias and two white complex tachycardias now let us move on to the treatment of tachyarrhythmias so remember we are talking about tachyarrhythmias with pulse tachyarrhythmias with pulse to be honest if the patient doesn't have a pulse then it becomes a cardiac arrest we have a separate algorithm for that so whenever you have a tachyarrhythmia with a pulse what you need to do first check the stability of the patient see where the patient is stable or unstable the most important sign of stability is systolic bp of more than 90 in case if the patient is having systolic bp of less than 90 we can say that the patient is unstable and in such situation you are going to immediately opt for synchronized dc cardioversion synchronized dc cardioversion synchronized dcc you all know what do you mean by synchronized dc cardioversion you are going to time the shock at the peak of the airway you need not do anything just press a button called sync button and the machine will take care of it that's called synchronized dc cardioversion and you have to know the standard contraindications for synchronized dc cardioversion or dc shock contraindication number 1 sinus tachycardia contraindication number 2 multifocal atrial tachycardia contraindication number 3 digoxin toxicity in these three conditions we don't really shock in rest of the conditions we can shock in these three conditions acls clearly recommends that shocking is contraindicated you can't do in case if the patient is stable okay defined as sbp more than 90 mm of mercury which means patient is stable so if the patient is stable next step is to see what kind of rhythm that you are dealing with whether it's a narrow complex tachycardia or a wide complex tachycardia so let us say you are dealing with a narrow complex tachycardia in case if you are dealing with a narrow complex tachycardia see the rhythm so rhythm can be regular or rhythm can be irregular if you are dealing with a regular rhythm then next step is to perform some vagal maneuvers vagal maneuvers means we are talking about carotid sinus massage or we can say valsalva something you are going to do but in practice commonly what we perform is carotid sinus massage that's what we commonly perform in case if vagal maneuvers are not responding the patient and the person and the vagal maneuvers are not working properly in such situation you can go for drugs because the success rate of vagal maneuvers is hardly 20 percentage so what drug you can give adenosine so if it's a regular rhythm and if, especially if it's a psvt adenosine becomes the drug of choice the dose of adenosine is 6 plus 12 plus 12 total is 30 mg so first you give 6 if it doesn't work you give it 12 and if it doesn't work give another 12 and it has to be given by rapid iv push because its half life is hardly 8 to 10 seconds so you have to make sure that adenosine reaches the heart faster if they ask you alternative to adenosine in case if you do not have adenosine in your hospital then you can choose beta blocker or alternatively you can choose a non dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker like verapamil or diltiazem so you can choose a beta blocker or a non dihydropyridine calcium channel blocker like verapamil or diltiazem and you have to be cautious here because adenosine and beta blocker are contraindicated in bronchial asthma and copd contraindicated in bronchial asthma and copd so in case if the examiner mentions that the patient is having history of bronchial asthma or copd the only choice that you are left with is verapamil or diltiazem be very clear about that you can neither use adenosine nor use beta blocker be very clear about it these are very very basic concepts and if it's a irregular rhythm the most important thing that you have to know in case of irregular rhythm is the fact that adenosine is contraindicated in irregular rhythms you cannot give adenosine because of various reasons which we can't discuss right now so what you will give either you can go for beta blocker or you can go for non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers like verapamil or diltiazem that's it going to white complex tachycardia in case if you are dealing with a white complex tachycardia the most important thing that you have to see is the morphology of the rhythm there are two options right 
either you can deal with the monomorphic rhythm or you can deal with the polymorphic rhythm the moment you know if you are dealing with the monomorphic polymorphic rhythm your treatment of choice will be magnesium sulfate you can do additional pacing also that's beyond the scope of the current discussion but if they ask you the drug of choice in this situation it's going to be magnesium sulfate in case if you are dealing with the polymorphic monomorphic rhythm in this situation you are going to start with some iv anti arrhythmic drugs for that matter even magnesium sulfate will be given iv so you're going to give iv anti arrhythmic drugs according to acls guidelines what are the iv anti arrhythmic drugs that you can use either you can use amiodrone or you can use procainamide procainamide or you can use sotalol any one of these three drugs you can use but in india what we commonly use is amiodrone in exams also most of the times the answer will be amiodrone so you know the initial bolus dose of amiodrone no? if they ask you initial dose of amiodrone it's almost always 300 mg after that i don't think they will ask you but the initial dose of amiodrone is almost always 300 mg and amiodrone is a drug with very large volume of distribution and you have to know each and every side effect of amiodrone right from head to toe it affects the eyes it affects the liver it affects the lungs it's going to affect uh, the skin even it can cause uh, the kind of bluish gray skin hyperpigmentation and so on so initial dose of amiodrone is always 300 mg iv that's a bolus dose of amiodrone so this is how you're going to manage any tachyarrhythmia for that matters the only extra thing that you need to know is atrial fibrillation in atrial fibrillation there are two things that you need to know so usually follow something called abc protocol a stands for anticoagulation that is something that you have to know for sure anticoagulation then b stands for better symptom control and c stands for control of risk factors in that anticoagulation is very very important so what you have to see step number 1 is to see whether the patient is having moderate to severe mitral stenosis or not second you have to see something called if the patient is having mechanical prosthetic valve or not mechanical prosthetic valve or not in in case if the answer is yes to any one of the question in if the answer is yes to any one of the question there is only one option that you can go for it is warfarin there is no doubt about that if the patient is having moderate to severe mitral stenosis or if the patient is having prosthetic mitral valve then the choice will be warfarin you cannot choose any other drug in case the answer to both of these questions is no patient is not having moderate to severe ms and patient is also not having any prosthetic valve then next step is to see a score called as chats2 vas score chats2 vas score to determine the need for long term anticoagulation in case if the chats2 vas score is less than 2 there is no need for anticoagulation no anticoagulation required in case if the chats2 vas score is 2 and above definitely you have to go for anticoagulation and it is a must it's a must 100% you need anticoagulation so what anticoagulation you can choose here either you can choose a doac or you can choose a warfarin so you all know what do you mean by doac these are direct oral anticoagulants and we have four drugs in this group so what are the four doacs we have dabigatran which is a direct thrombin inhibitor and we have three factor 10a inhibitors which are nothing but edoxaban rivaroxaban and apixaban so you are going to choose one of the three doacs one of the four doacs dabigatran rivaroxaban apixaban edoxaban so one is direct thrombin inhibitor remaining three are factor 10a inhibitors and the question is many of the times they will ask you the chats2 vas score so you cannot afford to miss this score so what does c stands for chf 1 point h stands for hypertension 1 point a2 stands for age 65 to 74 you get 1 point 75 and above you get 2 points d stands for diabetes 1 point s2 means we have two s in that one is history of stroke and taa it carries two points and another s is sex sex that is females by default carry one point vas stands for history of other vascular disease like coronary artery disease or peripheral arterial disease which carries another one point somebody is asking can we give doacs for prosthetic valve answer is no i told you very clearly only choices for foreign doacs cannot be given in patients with moderate to severe ms and patients who are having prosthetic valves at least according to current guidelines okay 
So the total score is going to range from 0 to 9. So the score is going to range from 0 to 9. As I said, score of 2 and above, you will go for anticoagulation for sure. And you can choose either DOIC or warfarin, but here the DOIC is going to be the better choice. If the patient is having moderate to severe MS or uh, prosthetic, mitral, prosthetic mechanical valve, then uh, you have to go for warfarin only. There is no role for DOIC. And what about B? B stands for better symptom control. B stands for better symptom control. There are two ways of symptom control, right? One is rate control and second is rhythm control. Rate control, rhythm control. If they ask you what is more important, it is going to be rate control all the time. What is more important? It's going to be rate control. All the time it's going to be rate control. That's more important. Rhythm control is only optional. So what are the drugs for rate control? See whether the patient is having acute heart failure or not. Whether the patient is having pulmonary edema or not. If the patient is having acute heart failure, then the choice will be digoxin according to FDA. In case if the patient doesn't have acute heart failure, you can choose either a beta blocker or you can choose a non diadopyrin calcium channel blocker depending on history of bronchial asthma. As I told you in exam, if they give history of bronchial asthma COPD, do not use beta blocker and use only non diadopyrin calcium channel blocker like verapamil, TLTR. So this is how you're going to go for a rate control. So how you do a rhythm control? Rhythm control. In case if you want a rhythm control, how you can do... So you can see where the patient is... I mean, first of all, there are two types of rhythm control. One is electrical rhythm control versus pharmacological rhythm control. Electrical is considered to be better. If they ask you which is better, it's always electrical rhythm control and not pharmacological rhythm control. In case if you want to choose pharmacological rhythm control, there are two options. You can choose class 3 drugs or you can choose class 1C drugs. That depends on whether you are dealing with a structural heart disease or not. Whether you are having any structural heart disease. For that, you need echocardiogram. In case if you are having any structural heart disease, then my drug of choice will become class 3, like amiodrone. In case if I don't have any structural heart disease, then my drug of choice will be class 1C, like flecainid or propofenone. So I'm going to use flecainid or propofenone. That's a class 1C drug. Here, usually what drug I will prefer is amiodrone, but we have other drugs like ibutilide, sotalol, and so on. So remember whether to choose class 3 or class 1C is based on the fact whether the patient is having structural heart disease or not. Very, very important point. Okay, so that completes the management of tachyarrhythmias. Then let us move on to the important bradyarrhythmias. So as far as I know, when it comes to exam, the bradyarrhythmias will be one of these five bradyarrhythmias only. Commonly, they will ask this only. So number one, it's a sinus bradycardia. Like sinus tachycardia, here everything will be fine. You're going to have P, QRS, T, and P wave and QRS will be in the ratio of 1 is to 1. And the only problem in the ECG will be bradycardia. That's it. Nothing else. So if that is the case, we're going to call it a sinus bradycardia. And in case if the only problem is the prolongation of the PR interval. So if the PR interval is prolonged. So you know what is the normal PR interval? It is 0 0.12 to 0 0.2 seconds or 120 to 200 milliseconds. If it's more than 200 milliseconds, we can call it as prolonged PR interval. In this case, we call it as first degree AV block or first degree heart block. In case if the patient is having a sequential plonking of the PR interval, like this, we're having a sequential plonking of the PR interval and all of a sudden there is one missed beat we're going to call it as Mobitz 1, second degree AV block. Mobitz 1, second degree AV block, which is also called as Venki back phenomenon. It is also called as Venki back phenomenon. And in case if your PR interval is constant, PR interval is constant, PR interval is not varying at all, PR interval is constant, no change in the PR interval, but all of a sudden, in between one beat is missed, this is called as Mobitz 2, second degree AV block. Mobitz 2, second degree AV block. So the main difference between Mobitz 1 and Mobitz 2 is the fact that PR will be varying in Mobitz 1, but PR will be constant in Mobitz 2. That's the main difference. PR will be varying in Mobitz 1, whereas PR will be constant in Mobitz 2. This is a major difference. How you can identify third degree AV block? Easily in exam. This is also called as complete heart block. How you can easily identify third degree AV block? Remember, there won't be any missed bit. In Mobitz 1 and 2, you saw a missed bit. In third degree AV block, usually you won't get any missed bit. There won't be any gap in between. But 
द पी आर विल बी Are you guys able to see? You're able to see, right? Yeah. Fine. All good. So, as I said, one of the most important ways to uh, find out the complete hard block or third degree block is to look at the ECG, find out that there is no. blocked bit in the sense like uh, there won't be any pause gap in between but your pr interval will be appearing to be varied so this is a characteristic feature of a complete hard block as i said here the term pr interval should not be used so why the term pr interval should not be used here because there is no relationship between p wave and the qrs the p waves are coming at its own pace regularly and qrs is also coming at its own pace regularly but there won't be any relationship between each other that is what we called as complete hard block or third degree av block so let me repeat one more time everything fine normal p normal qrs 1 is to 1 ratio um and no change in the pr interval sinus bradycardia everything fine only bradycardia sinus bradycardia only pr prolongation first degree av block any blocked beats think about mobits in that case see pr varying or not varying pr varying sequential prolongation mobits one thank you back pr constant mobits two and third degree av block there won't be any block bit there won't be any gap between qrs there won't be any blocked bit but the pr will be appearing to be very that is because of av dissociation so there you can diagnose complete hard block that's it these are the five important rhythms that you need to know now coming to the management of bradyarrhythmias so in exam they will ask you about management of acute bradyarrhythmias when are the patient is presenting with a acute bradyarrhythmia what you need to do is you need to see whether the patient is stable or unstable as usual again i'm talking about bradyarrhythmias with pulse if you don't have a pulse you have to go for cardiac arrest algorithm so if the patient is stable what you mean if the systolic bp is more than 90 mm of mercury as i said you are going to just observe the bradyarrhythmia i'm not going to do anything at all in case if the patient is unstable if the systolic bp is less than 90 mm of mercury the patient is unstable then in this case the next step is to give a drug called as atropin we have to give iv atropin and the usual dose of iv atropin is 0.5 mg 0.5 mg and the total maximum dose of atropin is 3 mg you can give three times total which means you can repeat twice you give first dose then second dose then third dose but make sure the total maximum dose does not exceed 3 mg right so in case if atropin is not working if atropin is not working then you can give back to back there is no specific gap between two doses so in case if atropin is not responding if you are not having any good response with atropin see dr smile is telling shock shock cannot be done remember shocking is approved only for tachyarrhythmias here we are dealing with bradyarrhythmia so there is no shock recommended here you have to go for pacing pacing there are two modalities of pacing one is transcutaneous pacing transcutaneous pacing where you can connect the leads to the skin surface and you can start pacing from outside this is also called as external pacing so this is done in times of emergency this is done in times of emergency so this is very crucial because you won't have time for putting a central vein and all that's why in times of emergency just go for external transcutaneous pacing which may be life saving but if you, if the patient is in the icu or the patient is already in the cardiac critical care unit 
then you can straight away go for transvenous pacing. If you have the expertise to do that, go for transvenous pacing, which is also called as internal pacing, which is basically the best. This is the best way to pace because the capture will be much better and you're directly pacing the heart from inside. So that's the best way of pacing. If expertise is there, you go for that. Otherwise, transvenous pacing, then you can shift to transvenous pacing later on once the expertise is available. And where will you pace? Generally, we pace the right ventricle plus or minus right atrium. So this is the standard site for pacing. Whenever somebody asks you where you're going to pace, you're going to pace in the right ventricle only. Maybe in some situations, you can pace the right atrium. If you pace only the right ventricle, it's called a single chamber pacing. If you pace both right ventricle and right atrium, it will be called as dual chamber pacing. That's all. And in case if you are in a primary healthcare center or a remote area where you don't have access to pacing, then alternative will be using some chronotropic drugs, drugs that increase the heart rate, like adrenaline or dopamine. You start these drugs and then you can shift the patient to a nearby tertiary center. But this is only temporary, okay? Only for time being it will work. Over time it will not work. So start with adrenaline and dopamine to increase the heart rate and immediately once you stabilize the patient, shift the patient to a nearby tertiary care center. That's all. So this covers the management of acute bradyrrhythmias as well, which is very important for exams. Next, let us talk about some important ECGs. So this ECG is often confused uh, with uh, multifocal atrial tachycardia and atrial fibrillation. Because this ECG looks as if the rhythm is irregular. Everyone can notice that the rhythm appears as if the rhythm is irregular, right? But it is not atrial fibrillation. So you might argue whether it's a multifocal atrial tachycardia or not. It is not multifocal atrial tachycardia also. Because I am seeing same morphology of PV. The PV morphology is not changing at all. The PV morphology looks the same. So an irregular rhythm having a PV plus P wave morphology is not changing also. This is very likely to be a sinus arrhythmia. This is very likely to be a sinus arrhythmia. It's a physiological response to inspiration and expiration. Which means during inspiration, the heart rate will increase generally. Inspiration increases heart rate. You can remember that with the help of a mnemonic, right? Inspiration increases heart rate. Inspiration will increase heart rate. On the other hand, during expiration, because of vagal activity, the heart rate will decrease. Expiration decreases heart rate. So this respiratory variation in the heart rate may be seen in the ECG. And that is what we call it as sinus arrhythmia. Simple. Don't confuse. The simple rhythm, usually in exam, they tend to give this kind of rhythms only. And most of the time, you tend to answer wrongly, thinking about whether it is a atrial fibrillation or multifocal atrial tachycardia. So it's a normal physiological response to inspiration and expiration. And we have some other rhythms, right? Like right bundle branch block and left bundle branch block. So first, only one thing that you have to look at is V1. The most important thing about any bundle branch block is you're going to have a white QRS. White QRS means your QRS width will be more than 0.12 seconds. You're going to have a white QRS. It's a must. Along with the white QRS, if you see a prominent positive deflection, prominent positive deflection in V1, or if you see the characteristic M pattern in V1, if you see a typical M pattern in V1, this is equal to right bundle branch block, or we can say RBBB pattern. On the other hand, if you see a prominent negative deflection in V1, prominent negative deflection in V1, this is likely to be a left bundle branch block pattern, LVBB pattern. So all you need to see is V1, that's all. In V1, if you have a white QRS with a prominent positive deflection or M pattern, right bundle branch block. If you have a prominent negative deflection in V1 with a white QRS, it is a left bundle mm -hmm. branch block, that's it. And now, coming to chamber hypertrophies. So we have two types of chamber hypertrophies, right? One is atrial hypertrophy, second is ventricular hypertrophy. So for atrial hypertrophy, all I need to look at is lead 2. In the lead 2, I need to look at the P wave. If the P wave is wide, if the P wave is wide, and if it's more than 3 millimeter, if it's more than 3 millimeter in width, or more than 0.12 seconds, or 120 milliseconds in width, or if you're seeing a M-like P wave, M-like P wave, or somebody's commenting by field P wave, whatever it is, this is often referred to as something called as P, 
and it is due to left atrial enlargement. Left atrial enlargement, the other way is called as P mitral. On the other hand, if you are going to see a tall P wave, you are going to see a tall P wave, you are going to see a tall P wave that is more than two and a half millimeter in height. Tall P wave that is more than two and a half millimeter in height. This is suggestive of right atrial enlargement, also called as P pulmonal. Also called as P pulmonal. That's it. This indicates right atrial enlargement. Now, one of the most important reasons for P pulmonal is, yeah, Epstein's is one reason, but the most common reason is going to be pulmonary hypertension. That's the reason for right atrial enlargement. Then coming to ventricular chamber hypertrophy, we have left ventricular hypertrophy and right ventricular hypertrophy. So what is the definition of left ventricular hypertrophy? We are going to look at something called as Sokolov-Leon criteria. Sokolov-Leon criteria, which is nothing but you have to see the S wave in V1, S wave in V1. Along with that, you have to add R wave in either V5 or V6. You take either V5 or V6, either V5 or V6, and add with that R wave in V5 or V6. And if it exceeds 35 millimeter, that is likely to be left ventricular hypertrophy. So that is what we call the Sokolov Leon criteria. This is one thing that you need to know. Apart from that, nothing else needs to be known. If it's gonna be right ventricular hypertrophy, we have a separate Sokolov Leon criteria for that also, where you have to look at the R wave in V1 and it should be more than 7 mm. If R wave in V1 is more than 7 millimeter, you're going to have right ventricular hypertrophy. You can argue, sir, then how will you differentiate between left bundle branch block and right bundle branch block? Because in left bundle branch block also, I saw a negative complex. Right bundle branch block also, I saw a positive complex. That's why I clearly said in LBB and RBB, the most important feature is white QRS. If you see white QRS with a prominent positive deflection, it is RBB. With a white QRS, if you have negative deflection, that is LBB. But if you don't have a white QRS, and if you have a big negative deflection in V1, and if you see R wave in V6 also, if it's also big, that's likely to be LVH. On the other hand, if you see a big positive deflection in V1, and if you don't have white QRS, think about the possibility of right ventricular hypertrophy. That's why that white QRS word is very, very important when it comes to bundle branch blocks. And another important ECG that commonly asked in exams is Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. That is WPW syndrome. So what are the two most important things that are seen in Wolf parkinson white syndrome? The most important is short PR. First change is short PR interval. Very, very important. Short PR interval. And apart from that, you are also going to see initial slurred QRS. That initial slurring of the QRS, that's called as delta wave. Whenever you have a short PR interval with a delta wave, that initial slurring of the QRS complex, it's very likely to be Wolf parkinson white syndrome. And you know, what are the signature arrhythmias in Wolf parkinson white syndrome? There are two signature arrhythmias. One is the PSVT, which is nothing but AVRT, that is atrioventricular re reentrant tachycardia. Second is pre-excited atrial fibrillation. Pre-excited atrial fibrillation. Which means, what do you mean by pre-excited atrial fibrillation? It is nothing but atrial fibrillation occurring in the setting of Wolf parkinson white syndrome. We are going to call it as pre-excited AF. And if they ask you treatment of choice for any Wolf parkinson white syndrome, it is radiofrequency ablation. Usually for asymptomatic patients, we don't do anything. But if the patient is symptomatic, 100%, the treatment of choice is going to be radiofrequency ablation. And you have to be careful. Remember, for AVRT, AV nodal blockers are okay. For AVRT, in fact, the treatment will be AV nodal blockers. AV nodal blockers in the sense where we can use... Uh, um, adenosine or beta blocker or NDCCB, they are fine actually for AVRT, but for pre excited AF, you cannot use AV nodal blockers. AV nodal blockers are absolutely contraindicated because whenever there is an atrial fibrillation, there will be 500 plus impulses coming from the uh, aphazard circuits in the left atrium and they are going towards the AV node and they are going towards the bundle of Kent also. You know that AV node slows down the impulses as much as possible. Bundle of Ken doesn't slow down. It transmits all the impulses. And if you block the AV node, all these finite impulses are going to go through the bundle of Ken and you are literally converting an atrial fibrillation into a ventricular fibrillation. 
that's why in pre exerted if whenever you have a atrial fibrillation in the presence of full parkinson white syndrome you should never ever touch any av nodal blockers and these are absolutely contraindicated and if they ask you the emergency drug of choice in that situation it's going to be procainamide which is a pure sodium channel blocker should never give any calcium channel blocker or a beta blocker that's the reason even amiodarone we don't use because amiodarone even though we call call it as a potassium channel blocker it is actually having other properties like beta blocking property and calcium channel blocking property that's the reason why we are going to only use procainamide in the situation otherwise don't give any other drug that's a very very important one or you can give quinidine also but commonly available drug is procainamide so drug of pre exerted af procainamide that's it don't go for av node blockers very very important point and the final ecg here is going to be long qt so this is actually an ecg of long qt so what do you mean by long qt if the corrected qt interval is more than 0.44 second in males or more than 4 6 seconds in females we are going to call it as long qt right and what are the important etiologies of long qt important etiologies of long qt so we can divide into congenital causes and acquired causes congenital causes and acquired causes congenital causes can be divided into autosomal dominant forms and autosomal recessive forms autosomal dominant forms are actually more common and these are called as romano watt syndrome romano watt syndrome and autosomal recessive forms are extremely rare and these are also called as jervell lange nielsen syndrome these are called as jervell lange nielsen syndrome and if you want to differentiate between romano watt syndrome and jervell lange nielsen syndrome it's simple autosomal recessive forms usually will have deafness patients with recessive forms will be deaf whereas your dominant form patients will not be having deafness so that's one of the most important ways to differentiate between dominant forms and recessive forms but dominant forms fortunately are more common compared to recessive forms if you look at your acquired forms which are basically the most common overall acquired forms so first you need to know the four hypos four hypos which are commonly asked in exam one is hypocalcemia second is hypokalemia third is hypomagnesemia and fourth is hypothermia so these are the four important hypos that are going to be associated with long qt number one apart from that drugs also are extremely important for causing long qt in fact currently in the world the most common cause of long qt is actually the drugs drugs are the most common cause of long qt in the world right now so and as such i can divide the drugs into anti microbials anti microbials or antibiotics that cause long qt anti histaminics can cause long qt anti psychotics can cause long qt anti psychotics can cause long qt and anti arrhythmic drugs also can cause long qt so we are talking about antimicrobials if you ask me what is the most important among all it's going to be antimicrobial drugs this is going to be most important so what are the important antimicrobials quinolones quinolones can cause long qt the name q itself is there no and macrolides macrolides also can cause long qt and azole antifungals ketoconazole um fluconazole all azoles can cause long qt and apart from that bedaquilin a newer drug very very important for exam it also has q in it so not don't forget bedaquilin can cause long qt so these are some of the important antimicrobials that can cause long qt and what about anti histaminic drugs the older generation anti histaminic drugs can cause long qt and anti psychotics any anti psychotic can cause long qt and anti arrhythmic drugs the class 1a and class 3 drugs because they can block the potassium channels in that if they ask you which is having highest potential then answer will be class 3 drugs class 3 drugs are having the highest potential to cause long qt because they are direct potassium channel blockers class 1a are sodium channel blockers but with some potassium channel blocking properties there so these are the anti arrhythmic drugs that can cause long qt and don't forget about hydroxychloroquine you can easily understand that hcq also has q in it so that is also going to produce long qt So as well as I would say, the quinolones, macrolides, bedaquilin, HCQ, antihistamine drugs. These are the most important drugs for exams. If you want to simplify stuff, 
So what is the danger of long QT? So whenever the patient is having long QT, it predisposes to development of something called early after depolarization. You would have studied in pharmacology, right? There are some important mechanisms of arrhythmias. Re-entry, then enhanced automaticity and triggered activity. In the triggered activity, we have early after depolarization and delayed after depolarization. In the early after depolarization, the most important background cause is going to be long QT. Whenever the patient is having early after depolarization, there is a high risk of polymorphic VT, that is torsade point. So that's why long QT patients, majority of them are going to die because of polymorphic VT and torsades. So that completes the most important ECGs. Now it's time that we go to management of acute coronary syndrome in the emergency. Have you guys understood whatever I told you till now? It's kind of a quick revision, right? Whatever we have done. Yes? Okay. Now let us move on to finish other areas. How to manage acute coronary syndrome in emergency. So you know, in exam, you are going to have chest pain. The patient will be coming with crushing pain and this pain will be substernal in location. And there are some things that will 100% tell you it is an acute coronary syndrome. What features will tell you that it's an acute coronary syndrome? Number one, patients will be having diaphoresis, sweating. Whenever examiner tells patient is having excessive sweating along with chest pain, that is 100% ACS, at least in exams. Second, there will be certain characteristic features like new onset chest pain, which means in the last few hours, if the pain is having chest pain. Second, if the pain is having crescendo pain. Crescendo pain means the pain keeps on increasing with time. Next is, if the examiner mentioned that the patient is having rest pain, very, very important point. Or third point, if the examiner mentioned the chest pain is not responding to nitroglycerin. The patient is taking nitroglycerin puff, but the pain is not settling. So these are typical features of acute coronary syndrome. Remember in chronic stable angina, the pain will occur only with exertion and it will be a fixed pain. The pain intensity will not change. It will not suddenly get worse. It'll, the patient will get the same type of pain over and over again and there will be a very very good response to nitroglycerin. So that is chronic stable angina and chronic stable angina patients usually does not complain of severe diaphoresis or rest pain also. So that's why these features almost always in exam suggest that you are dealing with the case of acute coronary syndrome. And if you suspect acute coronary syndrome in emergency, what do you need to do? Next step is to see ECG and ECG should be done within 10 minutes and you have to make ECG diagnosis within 10 minutes. And if ECG shows ST segment elevation, you are going to make a preliminary empirical diagnosis of STEMI and you follow STEMI guidelines. So first stabilize the patient and look for chest pain duration. Chest pain less than 12 hours or chest pain more than 12 hours. And you know that most of the patients will be presenting within the 12 hour window only. That's where most of the patients will fall under. If the patient presents within 12 hours, you have to immediately opt for reperfusion strategies. Try attempting reperfusion, which means you have to open up the vessel. The blocked vessel should be opened up. Reperfusion can be done either with thrombolysis or either it can be done with primary PCA, that is stenting. So if you are planning for thrombolysis, then they will ask you do it in real time. It is less than 30 minutes. Within 30 minutes, you have to thrombolyze. If you are planning for PPC, that is primary PC, then they will ask you door to balloon time, which is less than 90 minutes. Which means if you are planning for PCI, ideally it should be done within one and a half hours. It should be done within 90 minutes. And there are very important thrombolytic drugs. The dose of thrombolytic drugs is very, very important for exams. So one is streptokinase. Streptokinase, they will ask you. So the streptokinase dose is 1.5 million units, which is given as an IV infusion over 30 to 60 minutes. And second, they will be asking you RTPA, that is recombinant tissue plasmogen activator, which is also called as Altiplase. Altiplase will be usually given at a dose of 1 milligram per kilogram, and the maximum dose is going to be 100 milligram. That's the dose of Altiplase. And it has to be given as bolus. It has to be given in three forms. Initially, you have to give bolus, that is 0.15 milligram per kilogram, maximum is 15 milligram. Then you have to give 30 minutes infusion. 30 minutes infusion, that is uh, 0.5 milligram per kilogram, maximum of 50 milligram. 
and then you have to give another one hour infusion which is 0.35 mg per kilogram maximum is going to be 35 mg remember the dose of alteplase in mi and the dose of alteplase in your uh, stroke is quite different don't confuse then uh, you are having a drug called as ritaplase ritaplase is much easier to give all you need to do is give 10 units of ritaplase initially and after 30 minutes give another 10 units of ritaplase that's all so double bolus 10 units now and after 10 30 minutes repeat another 10 units both are given as bolus so ritaplase will be given as double bolus no infusion business here and then we have tinectoplase tinectoplase dose is 0.5 milligram per kilogram in mi and the maximum dose of tinectoplase is going to be 50 milligram maximum dose will be 50 milligram 50 so it is given as a single bolus the biggest advantage of tinectoplase is the fact that it will be given as a single shot that's it no infusion okay multiply weight by multi i mean 0.15 milligram per kilogram means yeah you take 0.15 and multiply by body weight that's all okay so this is about STEMI management in case if you do not have st elevation in case if you do not have st elevation you are going to see the risk of the patient where the patient belongs to low risk category or the patient belongs to high risk category so what do you mean by high risk remember whenever clinically the patient complains of typical chest pain it is high risk in exam by default all of your patients are high risk patients only examiner is not going to ask you about low risk patients by default every single patient in that comes in exam is high risk only because they will have the typical chest pain and second if the patient is having ischemic ecg obviously examiner will give some ischemic ecg for sure ischemic ecg in the sense he will give some st depression or t wave inversion so that is ischemic ecg number three if troponin is positive number four if echo is showing some regional wall motion abnormality which means areas of ischemia will not contract properly and those areas are called as rwms regional wall motion abnormalities so if you have any one of this we can stratify them as high risk by default i told you now in exam your patients will be having any of these features for sure so usually examiner will not like you to ask about this low risk patients they will only ask about high risk in exam so you blindly can take it as high risk unless proved otherwise so in high risk patient what you're going to do you're going to admit the patient and start with some adjunctive therapy start with adjunctive therapy so the question is what do you mean by this adjunctive therapy if you have attended my classes before you should be able to easily answer that i used to give a mnemonic called as mona bc so m stands for morphine M stands for morphine, optional, only if the pain is having severe anxiety, you can give morphine. O stands for oxygen, in case if saturation is less than 94%, you can give aspirin and oxygen. N stands for nitroglycerin, NTG, but you have to definitely avoid in patients with hypotension and right ventricular MI. Very, very important because NTG is something that's going to reduce the preload. And reducing the preload is not good in the setting of hypotension because it's going to worsen the hypotension and it's going to uh, cause shock in the setting of right ventricular MI. Be very, very clear about that. It's not only about right ventricular MI, even inferior wall MI. Inferior wall MI only commonly will have acid right ventricular MI because inferior wall and right ventricle are supplied by RCA, common territory. That's why you have to be very careful if it's an inferior MI or RVMI. You cannot give nitroglycerin because reducing preload is dangerous in that situation. And next is aspirin. Plus or minus, I can give a P2Y12 receptor inhibitor. So what is the P2Y12 receptor inhibitor? We have clopidogrel, prasugrel, ticagrelor. Three drugs are there. Clopidogrel, prasugrel, ticagrelor. Repeat, clopidogrel, prasugrel, ticagrelor. So you can try that combination. Then you can give beta blockers. Beta blockers, any beta blocker. Commonly what we give is metoprolol, but any beta blocker, after ruling out contraindications, you can give. The most important contraindication is going to be bronchial asthma COPD. And C stands for anticoagulation. Anticoagulation. So there are four anticoagulations. But remember, if you are not planning for PCA, then you are going to use enoxaparin. That is low molecular weight heparin. And the dose of enoxaparin will be 1 milligram per kilogram subcutaneous two times a day so this is the standard dose of enoxaparin that is one milligram per kilogram subcutaneous two times a day 
definitely you can use beta blockers in a diabetic patient, no contraindication. So enoxaparin, that's what you're going to choose in most cases. And 99.9% .9 of the times, you won't be wrong. You will be surely correct. And uh, plus or minus, other adjunctive therapy will be AC inhibitors and statins. If you want, you can use AC inhibitors and statins also, but it's up to you. Only optional. Later on, definitely we'll start. But we are talking about starting in emergency itself. In emergency itself, need not start with AC inhibitor and statins so urgently. You can wait for some time. Or if you want to start, you can start. It's up to you. And later on, while the adjunctive treatment is going on, you can decide on coronary angiogram. You can decide on coronary angiogram. In some situations, you will do coronary angiogram in the first two hours itself if the patient is very sick. If the patient is not very sick, then you can decide coronary angiogram after two hours in the next day also within 24 hours. Or in some patients who are ultimately extremely stable, you can even defer coronary angiogram and you can manage for medical management also. You can manage with medical therapy also. So it's all up to you. It all depends on so many other features, which is not important at the undergrad level. So decide on coronary angiogram later on, depending on so many other factors. So in exam, most of the times, they will be asking you either the STEMI guidelines or they will be asking you the adjunctive therapy guidelines. In that adjunctive therapy, the most important adjunctive therapy is the enoxaparin. Never ever forget that. So whenever examiner mentions NSTEMI or unstable angina, if they ask you the next step, always go for enoxaparin, you will be correct. And coming to ECG number one. So in this ECG, what you are seeing? You are seeing clear-cut ST elevation. Let us assume this patient came with chest pain. Sorry. Let us assume this patient came with chest pain. And as I told you, whenever somebody comes with chest pain, next step is to see the ECG. In this ECG, the patient is having ST elevation. You can notice that the patient is having a definite ST elevation in V2, V3, V4, V5, V6, and even a little bit of ST elevation, one AVL is there. So there are so many ST elevations. So it is anterior MI. That's correct. It's anterior MI only, but you know it is a ST elevation. So next step is to follow STEMI protocol. That's all. STEMI protocol, which means you stabilize the patient and plan for reperfusion. Either thrombolysis or PPCA, depending on the availability at that point of time. PCA is available, go for it. If it's not available, plan for thrombolysis. That's all. And if you look at the, this ECG, you will understand even further. So this patient also came with crushing chest pain. And if you look at this ECG, this patient is not having ST elevation. Remember, my idea is to see whether the patient is having ST elevation or not. This patient is not having ST elevation. Instead, this patient is having ST depression. ST depression at multiple areas. Or ST depression at multiple areas. So, what I'm going to do? This is high-risk patient by default. Why I'm telling high-risk patient? Because the patient is having typical chest pain. Second patient is also having ischemic ECG. So, this must be by definition high-risk only. If it's a high-risk individual, I'm going to deem this patient as high risk. If it's a high risk individual, you admit and start with Mona BC, that is adjunctive therapy. As I told you, the most important adjunctive therapy in this regards will be starting with enoxaparin, that is low molecular weight apparent. So that's going to be the most important. Okay, so this is how you manage this patient. Somebody is asking, what if the patient presents beyond 12 hours? Remember, if the patient is presenting beyond 12 hours, then I'll be following the same adjunctive therapy protocol. If there is ST elevation and the patient is presenting beyond 12 hours, I'll be following this only. I'll admit and start with adjunctive therapy and decide on coronary angiogram later on because patient is coming after 12 hours, no? So thrombolysis will not be effective. And at the same time, uh, what to say? Um, you cannot decide on coronary angiogram at that point of time. So wait, start with conservative therapy and then depending on the progress, uh, decide whether you need a coronary angiogram or not. Okay. Now let us move to next type of concepts. We'll talk about rheumatic fever. So you all know that rheumatic fever is due to gas infection. Gas means group A streptococcal infection. So that is the reason for development of rheumatic fever. And predisposed individuals will get recurrent rheumatic fever. And diagnosis of acute rheumatic fever will be based on something called as Duckett-Jones criteria or modified Jones criteria. 
So accordingly, we have major manifestations and we have minor manifestations. We have five major and five minor manifestations. And remember to apply Jones criteria, there should be evidence of streptococcal infection. Without evidence of streptococcal infection, I cannot even apply Jones criteria. Without evidence of streptococcal infection, I will not be even able to apply Jones criteria. So what will be the evidence of streptococcal infection? In exam, examiner may give history of pharyngitis. But in practice, this is not alone enough. You need to have ASO titers and anti-DNSB titers to be elevated. This is very, very important. You have to have elevations in the ASO and anti-DNSB titers. Just hold on. We are going to uh, look at AS1 anti DNSP titers, which will be elevated. Right. So, what are the major Jones criteria? We are going to look at something called as cases. And for minor criteria, we have a mnemonic called as PEACH. So, this is a traditional mnemonic that's called PEACH cases. C stands for carditis. And this carditis usually will be a pancarditis. Right. It will be a pancarditis. And A stands for arthritis. This arthritis is the most common manifestation of acute rheumatic fever. They ask you what is the most common manifestation? It is arthritis. And arthritis will be a non-erosive migratory polyarthritis. Non-erosive migratory polyarthritis. And S stands for subcutaneous nodules. The most important point about subcutaneous nodules is they are painless nodules. They are painless nodules. And E stands for erythema marginatum. The most important feature of erythema marginatum is the fact that it doesn't occur in the face. The most common site will be on the trunk. And S stands for sedanum scoria. The important point about sedanum scoria is it has the longest latency period. Longest latency period. Longest latency in the sense it might take around 1 to 8 months to appear. For some people, it will be very... Uh, surprising because they will not even remember the history of pharyngitis but after 6 months or 7 months they will suddenly come with chorea. And in exam usually they will ask about what are the I mean, uh, treatment of certain arms chorea. That's very commonly asked. If it's a mild case then you can manage with haloperidol itself. If it's a severe case of certain arms chorea then you can manage with valparate or carbazepin but in exam always answer valparate you will be right. For refractory cases, you can use either corticosteroids like prednisolone or IVAG. Anyone you can use. For mild cases, go for alloperidol. For severe cases, answer valparate or carbazepin. Valparate will be right. And for refractory cases, go for corticosteroids and IVAG. So this is how the examiner will frame the question. How to treat symptoms chorea. What are the minor manifestations? PR interval prolongation, ESR elevation, Arthralgia, not arthritis, CRP elevation and high temperature. That is history of fever. Fever. Okay, high temperature, fever. So these are the minor criteria. According to Jones criteria, first attack of acute rheumatic fever can be diagnosed. First attack of acute rheumatic fever can be diagnosed with at least two major criteria or one major and at least two minor criteria. One major and two minor criteria. For rec diagnosing recurrent attacks of acute rheumatic fever, you can use the same criteria, but additionally, you can also use what? Three minor criteria. Even three minor criteria is enough to make a diagnosis of recurrent attacks of acute rheumatic fever. For recurrent AF, ARF, you don't need this two major or one major, two minor. It's just three minor criteria. With that itself, you can make a diagnosis of recurrent attacks of acute rheumatic fever. But for everything, you should have evidence of streptococcal infection. Without that, you cannot make a diagnosis of rheumatic fever. And you know, these are the lesions that are pathognomonic for rheumatic fever, very commonly asked in exam, which are nothing but Ashkoff bodies. The cells inside the Ashkoff bodies are histiocytes, which are called as Anjko cells or caterpillar cells. And this is how erythema marginatum lesions look like. 
they are going to be very common in the trunk and they usually don't occur in the face and here is how you are going to have your subcutaneous nodules very common over the tendons this is where you are going to see the subcutaneous nodules very commonly and WHO guidelines are not important when it comes to secondary prophylaxis only ACCHA guidelines are important so in case if you do not have carditis and valvulitis the guideline says that you have to give for a duration of five years or you have to give till 21 years of age whichever is late whichever is late if it's carditis only then you have to give for 10 years total duration or till 21 years of age whichever is late if it's valvulitis you have to give 10 years of duration or till 40 years of age whichever is late in case of severe valvular damage like heart failure or if the patient ends up with mitral valve replacement with severe damage then it's going to be essentially lifelong WHO guidelines are slightly different for example they will say five years or till 18 years of age year they will tell 10 years or till 25 years of age year and for all valvulitis they mention lifelong so because Harrison mentions only ACCHA I will usually not recommend you to follow WHO guidelines so follow these guidelines so no carditis valvulitis 5 years 21 years only carditis 10 years or 21 years only valvulitis 10 years or 40 years if there is any severe level valve damage you have to go for lifelong prophylaxis if they ask you drug of choice for prophylaxis it is IM benzathine penicillin IM benzathine penicillin IM benzathine penicillin and how frequently you are going to give you are going to give every 3 to 4 weeks in patients who are at low risk, which means if you are living in the United States or any developed country, then you can go for once in four weeks. But if you are living in India, which is by default a high risk country, then you can go for three weeks. So in India, it's always three weeks because we are living in a high risk situation. And the dose of benzathine penicillin will be depending on the body weight. If it's less than 27 kilogram, the dose will be 600,000 units or we can call it as 0.6 million units. If the patient is 27 kilogram and above, the dose will be 1.2 million units or 12 lakh units. That's the standard dose and should be given every one to years. Alternative, second choice will be sulfadiazin. If the patient is having sulfur allergy, then the third line alternative will be macrolides like erythromycin or azithromycin. That's only third choice. Second choice is always sulfadiazin. That completes rheumatic fever also. Now let us talk about infective endocarditis. So when it comes to infective endocarditis, there are two to three things that are quite important. One is the organisms. Organisms in infective endocarditis. So organism-wise, you can split into native valve endocarditis and second is prosthetic valve endocarditis. When it comes to native valve endocarditis, see whether the presentation is subacute presentation or acute presentation. If you are dealing with a subacute presentation, that is subacute bacterial endocarditis, it's likely to be a viridans group streptococcus or simply streptococcus viridans. If it's an acute disease, fulminant disease, you're going to think about staph aureus. You're also going to think about staph aureus in patients who are IV drug users, patients who are having central venous catheters, patients who are on renal replacement therapy, patients who are having infect, sorry, uh, hospitalization, long-standing IV cannulas. So any hospitalized individual, you think about staph aureus only. Only community accord, especially in exam, if they mention dental infection, dental procedures, or poor dental hygiene, anything related to the mouth, then you suspect viridans group streptococcus because these are common cells in the mouth. And for prosthetic valve endocarditis, you see whether the infection is occurring in the first 12 months or after 12 months. After 12 months, the incidence will be similar to native valve endocarditis, that is either viridans or staph. But in the first 12 months, it will be usually due to coagulous negative staphylococcus or it's going to be staph aureus. But most often than not, it will be due to coagulous negative staphylococcus aureus, cons. That's what you have to answer if it's a early prosthetic valve endocarditis in the first 12 months. Example of coagulous negative staphylococcus is staph epidermidis. Example of coagulous negative staphylococcus is staph epidermidis. That's correct. So these are the overall look of the organisms. Uh, that are associated with infected endocarditis. But diagnosis-wise, importantly, what they will ask you is the Duke's criteria. So don't worry about the modifications and all. The crux of the Duke's criteria is what is going to be the most important. 
accordingly we have major criteria and we have minor criteria so what are the two major criteria one is based on blood culture blood culture positivity so remember you should have at least i mean you should have at, at least three blood cultures should be taken how many blood cultures should be taken minimum three blood cultures very important point at least three blood cultures should be taken and it should be taken from separate vein puncture sites different different sites you have to take and the gap between the first culture and the last culture should be at least one hour that's very important you can take 10 cultures also it's up to you but minimum three and the gap between the first and the last culture should be at least one hour and the idea is very simple how much ever blood cultures you take you take but majority of them will be positive majority of them should be positive to fulfill the first criteria and it should yield the same organism majority of them should be positive and it should yield the same organism the only standard exception to the rule will be coxella bernati where even a single positive culture is significant you know coxella bernati is going to cause q fever so the only standard exception as i told you is coxella bernati in that only one positive culture is enough apart from that for everything else you should have majority of the culture should be positive which means if you take three at least two should be positive if you take five at least four three should be positive if you take 10 cultures at least six should be positive so majority should be positive and it should be yielding the same organism number two imaging evidence remember the most common imaging modality or the first imaging modality that we do is going to be trans thoracic echocardiogram but the best imaging modality for diagnosing infrared cardiogram will be trans esophageal echo that's the best so what you are trying to see in imaging you are going to see something called vegetations which will be usually seen in the tip of the valve second you are going to look at uh, something called as prosthetic valve dehiscence many times the prosthetic valve that is stitched to the side of the annulus will be torn and i have even seen cases where the valve will be free floating in the chambers so that's called prosthetic valve dehiscence the valve is just torn apart from the surroundings or if you have a new valvular regurgitation i e never produces stenotic lesions it only produces regurgitant lesions valvular regurgitation so if you have any of this i can say it's a positive imaging then what about the minor criteria what about the minor criteria so first we have the fever the most common manifestation of rheumat i mean uh, infected endocarditis this is the most common feature of infected endocarditis then we have uh, the predisposing fa factors if you have any predisposing factors like valvular heart disease or congenital heart disease or immunosuppressed state iv drug abuse these are all predisposing factors number 3 blood cultures will be positive but not meeting the major criteria blood cultures are positive but not majority is positive which means it's not meeting the major criteria not meeting major criteria so that is coming under minor criteria only next is immunological phenomena we have four immunological phenomena right we have rot spots osler nodes glomerulonephritis rheumatoid factor positivity and one vascular phenomenon is four vascular phenomena is there what are vascular phenomena janeway lesions septic emboli mycotic aneurysms and ich janeway lesions septic emboli mycotic aneurysms and intracranial hemorrhage so accordingly if you have more than equal to two major criteria sorry only two is there no overall so if you have both the major criteria or one major plus at least three minor criteria or all five minor criteria all five minor criteria you can make a diagnosis of infected endocarditis two major or one major three minor or all five minor criteria fulfilled you can probably make a diagnosis of infective endocarditis and here is an example of rot spots rot spots are immunological phenomenon and they are hemorrhagic spots and here is an example of osler nodes they are immunological phenomenon and they are quite painful they are painful here are the examples of janeway lesions janeway lesions are maculopapular eruptions or simply macular eruptions and they are painless lesions they won't have pain painless lesions and they are vascular phenomena and this is not given in the criteria but still very useful in clinical practice that is splinter hemorrhages 
splinter hemorrhages in exam often if they mention splinter hemorrhages you are dealing with infect endocarditis unless proved otherwise okay another important area in exam is to look at the prophylaxis of infect endocarditis so first you need to know the indications of prophylaxis then when to give then what to give so there are only four standard indications for prophylaxis we all know one is history of prior infect endocarditis if the pain has already had an attack of infect endocarditis then you have to definitely consider second is presence of prosthetic valves, especially mechanical valves, but for biological valves also. Presence of prosthetic valves. Third one, cardiac transplantation with valvulopathy. It's not just cardiac transplantation. The transplant should have associated valve problem also. That is cardiac transplant with valvulopathy. Fourth is going to be congenital heart disease based indications. In that any unrepaired synodic congenital heart disease is an indication. Any unrepaired synodic congenital heart disease is an indication or it could be repaired congenital heart disease. It can be synodic or asynodic, it doesn't matter. It's a repaired congenital heart disease. But in two situations, if they have used some prosthetic material and in this situation, for the first six months alone, prophylaxis is recommended. They use some prosthetic material for repair and in that situation only for the first six months it's recommended or if there is any ongoing leak. That is if the patient is having defective repair. If the patient is having defective repair. Defective repair means it's not a complete repair and there is an ongoing leak. In that situation also you can give prophylaxis. Next is when to give. Only two situations. One is dental procedures. Second is invasive respiratory tract procedures. Like for example, bronchoscopy and biopsy. I told you so many times in my classes that only bronchoscopy does not require prophylaxis. But bronchoscopy and biopsy will require prophylaxis. That's what you mean by invasive respiratory tract procedures. And what to give? Usual choice will be amoxicillin or ampicillin. Depending on whether you want an oral drug or IV drug. If the patient is the NPO, then choose some ampicillin. The standard dose is 2 gram. In case if the patient is having penicillin allergy, penicillin allergy, then I can use, cannot use amoxicillin or ampicillin. So my choice will be clindamycin, which is available both oral and IV. And I am going to use 600 milligram. That is the standard dose of clindamycin. When you will give these drugs? It is a stat dose. Single dose, 30 to 60 minutes prior to procedure. 30 to 60 minutes prior to procedure. Just a single dose, a stat dose, you are going to give 30 to 60 minutes prior to intended procedure. Okay, that's all. So this is the antibiotics. Ampicillin, amoxicillin or clindamycin. Anyone you can choose depending on the need. So now, let us move on to the JVP, jugular venous pressure. So you know that jugular venous pressure has some characteristic waveforms. Right. This is how it's going to look like. Or more accurately, I can draw like this. Yeah. A, C, X descent, V wave, Y wave. Right. So what is the reason for the A wave? It is due to atrial contraction. So whenever atrial contraction is powerful, you are going to get a large A wave. So what are the conditions that are going to result in large A wave? Only two conditions. Tricuspid stenosis and pulmonary hypertension. Classic. And this has been asked so many times in exam. Large JV in tricuspid stenosis. And even in pulmonary hypertension, you can have a large JV. And second condition, absent JV. When you have absent JV, atrial fibrillation, where there is no atrial contraction at all. Then we have something called Karen waves. Karen waves. Karen waves occur whenever atrium and ventricle are contracting together. In that, we have regular forms of Karen waves. Regular forms of Karen waves. Regular Karen waves usually occurs in PSVT. Like AVNRT and AVRT. Irregular Karen waves occur in the setting of AV dissociation. We have discussed so many times in the past that there are only two important causes of AV dissociation in medicine. One is complete heart block, third degree AV block. Second is ventricular tachycardia. These are the two classic conditions that produces AV dissociation. And then C wave. C wave is due to isovolumetric ventricular contraction where 
the tricuspid valve is going to bulge into the right atrium. That produces small positive pressure. There is no abnormality because this is a waveform that we don't see in practice. It's a, it's a lab finding. What about extrusion? Extrusion occurs during rapid ejection phase where the atrial floor is pulled down towards the ventricles so that the atrium expands resulting in a negative pressure. So there are two possibilities. One is there will be a prominent extrusion. Second is there is a blunted extrusion. So where will you see a prominent extrusion? Most important condition is going to be cardiac tamponade. Cardiac tamponade is a condition where you are going to see a prominent extrusion. Very important. Then you can see in constrictive pericarditis also. But I believe tamponade is going to be the most important. And where will you see a blunted extrusion? Blunted extrusion will be seen in conditions like tricuspid regurgitation. The most important condition. That's where you are going to see a blunted extrusion. Very, very important condition. Tricuspid regurgitation. What about V-wave? V-wave occurs due to venous filling of the atrium. The SVC and IVC is going to fill the right atrium and that is the reason for the V-wave. So if something else is filling the right atrium, you can have a large V-wave. So accordingly, they will ask you what are the cause of large V-wave. The most important condition is tricuspid regurgitation. Apart from that, it can occur in constrictive pericarditis, it can occur in ASD, it can occur in total anomalous pulmonary venous connection, but the first two are extremely important. The TR and constrictive pericarditis. These are the classic conditions that produce a large wave. The TR is very, very important. And why doesn't is due to ventricular filling by right atrium. RV filling by right atrium. And it occurs, yes, during the rapid passive filling phase of the right atrium. And this is going to um, be the core of understanding the importance of the small wide descent and prominent wide descent. So the wide descent can be prominent or it can be blunted, less prominent. Where you get a prominent wide descent, prominent wide descent will be seen in constrictive pericarditis, very, very important. Constrictive pericarditis and sometimes in tricuspid regurgitation also. In constrictive pericarditis, this large wide descent is also called as Friedrich sign. This large wide, wide descent in constrictive pericarditis is also called as Friedrich sign. If you have a blunted wide descent, only two T's are there, two causes, tricuspid stenosis and tamponade. Tricuspid stenosis and tamponade. So two T's. These are two T's that are going to produce a blunted wide descent. So wide descent means the ventricular filling is restricted. What is going to restrict the ventricular filling? Either a tricuspid stenosis or tamponade fluid from outside is compressing the ventricle. So which is going to result in restricted ventricular filling. So that's why the wide descent will be blunted here. So these are the important like causes of abnormal waveforms in the JV. Now let us move on to the heart sounds. We have first, second, third, fourth, and we have some extra sounds like systolic, diastolic, and multiphasic sounds. When it comes to first heart sound, they will ask you what are the causes of loud first heart sound. Loud first heart sound. What is going to produce loud first heart sound? MS and TS, that is mitral stenosis and trichostenosis. Apart from that, tachycardia, short PR interval, and hyperdynamic states like anemia, thyrotoxicosis, sepsis, these also can produce loudest one. But in exam, the most important is MS and TS. If you can, remember short PR also. Everyone knows that short PR occurs in wolf parkinson white syndrome. So indirectly, I am saying that wolf parkinson white syndrome causes loudest one. Because short PR in exam always means wolf parkinson white syndrome only. Okay, so what are the causes that will result in soft S1? Soft S1 means the valve is not closing properly. Most importantly, MR and TR. Okay, MR and TR are classic causes of soft S1 because they are regurgitant lesions here. The valve will not even hit properly. Apart from that, if you have extreme bradycardia, prolonged PR interval, and more importantly, heart failure, CCF, heart failure. Heart failure is also a very, very important cause that can result in the development of soft S1. So don't forget MSTS, MRTR. MSTS loud S1, MRTR soft S1. Short PR interval, loud S1. Long PR interval, prolonged PR interval, soft S1. What about S2? S2 unit is made of two sounds, right? A2 and P2. It's made of aortic sound and it's made of pulmonic sound. So you need to know what are the conditions that are associated with loud A2. What are the conditions that are associated with loud P2. And what are the conditions associated with loud soft A2. And what are the conditions that are associated with soft P2? Just one one condition I'm going to say, nothing more than that. Loud A2 will be associated with systemic hypertension. 
right whenever there is hypertension the valve closes all of a sudden so that will produce a loud banging sound what about loud p2 that will be seen in pulmonary hypertension same thing a2 means systemic hypertension p2 means pulmonary hypertension that's all where you will have a soft a2 soft a2 will be seen in valvular aortic stenosis aortic stenosis especially in old age in old age very high have a calcification and degeneration of the valve so you're going to have only soft a2 where you have a soft p2 valvular pulmonic stenosis valvular pulmonic stenosis the best example of a syndrome causing pulmonic stenosis is noonan syndrome noonan syndrome is a classic example of pulmonic stenosis okay nevertheless so now you know one one cause of loud a2 loud p2 soft a2 and soft p2 but in exam what they will ask you is the splitting of the sound the splitting of the sound splitting of the second heart sound so splitting can be normal that is defined as a2 p2 like this splitting can be wide so where i can write wide the reason for wide splitting will be either early a2 or late p2 early a2 or late p2 then we have narrow splitting where it can be written as a2 p2 and we have reverse splitting reverse splitting or we can call it as paradoxical splitting also where the splitting will reverse like it will be p2 a2 so what are the causes of white splitting white splitting means i should have a early a2 or a late p2 so the condition that causes early a2 is severe mr and vst severe mr and vst is going to cause early a2 and there are some conditions that can cause late p2 so what are the conditions that cause late p2 yes of course asd can cause late p2 because of more movement of blood across the right ventricle and into the pulmonary artery and more importantly i would say right bundle branch block and right ventricular outflow tract obstruction right ventricular outflow tract obstruction for example if you have a pulmonic stenosis pulmonic stenosis where the p2 will be very late because there is right ventricular outflow tract obstruction the right ventricle tends to contract for a long long period of time so what are the conditions that are going to have narrow p2 yeah tapvc also can cause but i'm telling only the most important possibilities in exam once again So narrow splitting of the second heart zone that is A2 and P2. So here either the A2 must be late or P2 must be early. So what are the things that are going to cause late A2? That is left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. If there is a LVOT obstruction, left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, whenever I talk about LVOT obstruction, it must be either AS or it must be HOCM. That is hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy these are the common things that are going to produce left ventricular outflow tract obstruction um if you want to know what are the conditions that cause early p2 it's going to be pulmonary hypertension pulmonary hypertension because of pulmonary hypertension high pulmonary pressure the pulmonary valve will close early so it is early p2 so either early p2 or late a2 so both are both of them are going to cause narrow split so if you want to get paradoxical split there should be very late a2 the a2 must be extremely late very late a2 very late a2 so for that i should have a severe lvot obstruction severe lvot obstruction where i should have severe as or severe hocm or alternatively we can have left bundle branch block also lvb is also very important cause so left bundle branch block will make the left ventricle contract very slowly over a period of time so the a2 will be very very late so that's a very important cause of your uh, very late to resulting in paradoxical split variable split there's nothing called variable split as far as i know it's actually widely split 
as to only so on, in severe vsd there will be widely split and there is something called fixed splitting so what are the conditions that cause fixed splitting only asd and right ventricular failure asd and in right ventricular failure you encounter something called fixed split which means the split timing will not change at all no matter what whether it's inspiration expiration valsalva it doesn't matter the split timing remains the same so just remember these two causes fixed asd rvf in that the most important cause if you want to know that is asd that tends to produce a fixed split so that's why traditionally it's marked up as asd will cause a wide fixed split so these are the important concepts that you need to know and what about the third heart sound s3 so third heart sound usually occurs in ventricular volume overload whenever the ventricle is having more volume you get third heart sound so it can be completely physiological or it can be pathological so physiological third heart sound usually occurs in patients who are younger like less than 35 years of age and sometimes it can occur during severe fever or anemia or during pregnancy sepsis so sometimes it can occur physiologically but what about pathological third heart sound the most important pathological third heart sound is the one that occurs in heart failure very very important heart failure very very important cause of pathological third heart sound apart from that mr tr ar and any volume overload state mr tr ar anything can produce third heart sound but the most important as far as i know is going to be the ccf heart failure what about the fourth heart sound fourth heart sound is due to atrial contraction against a stiff ventricle whenever the ventricle is very stiff and atrium is contracting you get fourth heart sound so accordingly lvot obstruction is the most important cause of fourth heart sound because of pressure overload whenever you have lvot obstruction because to bypass the obstruction the ventricle has to contract harder so the muscles will be like arnold schwarzenegger so because of thick muscle stiffness of the ventricle in as and hocm commonly you will get fourth heart sound and apart from that in elderly patients in patients who are having coronary artery disease or patients are having hypertension so in these patients also the ventricles are supposed to be stiff yes rcm another very important cause you can write strict cardiomyopathy also but i will say that this hypertension coronary artery disease and lvot obstruction are the most important causes of fourth heart sound remember third heart sound is a early diastolic sound early diastolic sound whereas fourth heart sound is a late diastolic sound it's not a early diastolic sound so late diastolic sound occurs during the final phase of ventricular diastole that is atrial kick or atrial contraction what about the systolic sounds so we have ejection clicks and we have non ejection clicks non ejection click classic example of a non ejection click is mitral valve prolapse mitral valve prolapse click will be non ejection click only it will be a mid systolic click ejection click will be early very early and typically occurs in valvular aortic stenosis and pulmonic stenosis in valvular as and valvular ps you can hear a ejection click so as when it will produce ejection click especially if the patient is having a bicuspid aortic valve especially if the patient is having bicuspid aortic valve then very likely you will have ejection click because in old people the cause of aortic stenosis will be degenerative aortic stenosis so valve will be calcified so it's unlikely to produce ejection click but in young patients who are having bicuspid aortic valve and if they have aortic stenosis there is high possibility the valve will be very good without much calcification so you might get a good nice ejection click yeah your uh, bicuspid aortic valve is associated with turner syndrome that's correct so what about diastolic sounds diastolic sounds can be divided into opening snaps pericardial knocks and your tumor plops so what about opening snap opening snap will be typically heard in ms and ts mitral stenosis and tricuspid stenosis and we have pericardial knock pericardial knock is typically heard in constrictive pericarditis pericardial knock then we have a tumor plop tumor plop that is heard in the setting of atrial myxoma atrial myxoma that's tumor plop so opening snap ms ts pericardial knock constrictive pericarditis and tumor plop is going to be due to atrial myxoma and all these three sounds are early diastolic sounds occur during the rapid passive filling s3 is also an early diastolic sound that brings us to the conclusion that only one sound is late diastolic that is fourth heart sound only sound that is late diastolic is fourth heart sound everything else is basically early diastolic sound only
in that which are the low pitch sounds i can say that s3 s4 and tumor block these are the only three low pitch sounds in cardiology everything else that we have discussed is high pitched for example ejection click non ejection click pericardial knock opening snap all of them are basically high pitched sounds only the only low pitched sounds are s3 s4 and tumor block and what about multiphasic sounds we have pericardial rub pericardial rub typically occurs in acute pericarditis acute pericarditis and we have the harmons mediastinal crunch this is also simply called as harmons crunch that occurs in a condition called as pneumo mediastinum pneumo mediastinum so pericardial rub will occur in acute pericarditis and harmons mediastinal crunch will occur in pneumo mediastinum simple stuff easy ones okay that completed our uh, discussion on sounds also now it's time that we discuss on the cardiac murmurs so first we are talking about systolic murmurs then we'll go to the diastolic murmurs systolic murmurs means we have early systolic murmur like this then we have the mid systolic murmur which is also called as ejection systolic murmur which will be usually diamond shaped also referred to as crescendo decrescendo murmur or it is called as a diamond shaped murmur and then we have the late systolic murmur like what you see here and we have a pan systolic murmur or sometimes called as holo systolic murmur pan systolic or holo systolic murmur so early systolic murmur only one cause you need to know that is papillary muscle dysfunction papillary muscle dysfunction which typically occurs in acute mitral regurgitation acute mr which in turn occurs very commonly in inferior myocardial infarction inferior volume so acute mr causes papillary muscle due to papillary muscle dysfunction produces early systolic murmur mid systolic murmur lot of causes whenever there is outflow tract obstruction you are going to get mid systolic murmur or ejection systolic murmur only like for example in as hocm and ps so in all these conditions it will be a mid systolic or ejection systolic murmur late systolic murmur will be because of mvp with mr whenever there is a mitral valve prolapse along with mr there will be a mid systolic click followed by a late systolic murmur i repeat in mvp with mr there will be a mid systolic click followed by a late systolic murmur and psm pan systolic murmur only two three possibilities one is mitral regurgitation second is tricuspid regurgitation third is going to be vsd pda will produce continuous murmur not holo systolic murmur so mr is going to be heard in the apex in the mammal radiate axilla and tr murmur and vsd murmur will be heard in the left lower sternal border better heard in the left lower sternal border and in that mr murmur is going to increase with expiration because it's left sided vsd murmur is also going to increase with expiration because it's a left sided problem there will be left to right shunt only in tr murmur alone the murmur will increase with inspiration because it's a right sided event we all know that right sided events are augmented with inspiration because the flow to the right side increases during inspiration and what about the diastolic murmurs diastolic murmurs we have two murmurs one is early diastolic murmur and second is mid diastolic murmur then we have the continuous murmur throughout systole and diastole it's a early diastolic murmur you have
Are able to see now? Yeah. All right. So we have uh, early diastolic murmur, right? That's what I started. Early diastolic murmur. Early diastolic murmur can be due to either aortic regurgitation or it can be due to pulmonic regurgitation. PR. When it comes to PR, it can be due to valve problem, that is valvular PR, or it may be due to pulmonary hypertension. This is called as hypertensive PR. And the pulmonary hypertension causing PR will be called as Graham Stillman. The other name given to that is Graham Stillman. And when it comes to mid-diastolic murmur, the most important causes will be MS and TS. And if you want to add two other special murmurs, one is Karekum's murmur, Karekum's murmur, that is because of mitral valvulitis occurring in acute traumatic fever. Mitral valvulitis occurring in acute traumatic fever. Next will be Austin Flynn murmur, right? Austin Flynn murmur that occurs in patients with severe aortic regurgitation. Austin Flint murmur. Austin Flint murmur. That is going to occur in severe air. But the most important in this regards is going to be the MS and TS, mitral stenosis and tricuspid stenosis. That's the most important. Other two, okay, if you want, it's good to remember, but the MS and TS you should never forget for mid diastolic murmur. What about the continuous murmurs? There are a lot of things that produce continuous murmurs. At your level, the most important is going to be PDA, which is also called as Gibson's machinery murmur. That is patent ductus arteriosus. Number two, we have something called Lutenbacher syndrome, which is nothing but a combination of MS and atrial septal defect combination. That's what we call as Lutenbacher syndrome. Number three, yeah, we'll decide. Number three, non coactation of it. Remember, Coactation of iota will produce mid-diastolic murmur only. Coactation of iota will produce adjacent systolic murmur only. The collaterals of the coactation of iota. Any collateral murmur will be continuous murmur. The collaterals of coactation of iota is the one that's going to produce the continuous murmur. And number four, any AV fistula will produce continuous murmur. Then we have rupture of sinus of valsalva aneurysm, RSOV aneurysm. That also tend to produce a continuous murmur. A very common question in exam, RSOV aneurysm, that is rupture of sinus of valsalva aneurysm. Especially if it ruptures into right-sided chambers, you tend to develop continuous murmur. And apart from that, uh, we have venous hum and mammary sofal, which are innocent murmurs. Venous hum occurs in children in the neck because of heavy venous flow, and mammary sofal occurs in mammary sofal occurs in breast of a pregnant or a lactating mother because of the high blood flow. So, venous and mammary sofal are basically innocent murmurs. They are just benign murmurs. So, these are the examples of continuous murmurs. So, all the murmurs are done. Now, let us move on to valvular heart disease. Some of the important concepts of valvular heart disease. And we are going to discuss all the four valvular heart disease in a nutshell. So, what will be the pulse in MS? Pulse in MS, 100% will be hypokinetic. And if you ask me the cause of mitral stenosis, the only one cause is going to be rheumatic heart disease, nothing else. RSD is going to be the only one cause. So pulse is going to be hypokinetic in nature and uh, BP will be normal, JVP will be normal. Remember, all valvular heart disease are left-sided problems, left-sided issues. So JVP by definition will be normal. They will be abnormal only if the patient is having pulmonary hypertension. The large J-wave can be seen if the patient is having pulmonary hypertension or they can have absent A if they have atrial fibrillation. Unless and until they have pulmonary hypertension or atrial fibrillation, the JVP will not be altered. Or if they have heart failure, then JVP can be elevated. Always JVP will be fairly normal in majority of these conditions at the beginning. Epical impulse, typically non-displaced because LV size is normal here. And the nature of the epical impulse will be more tapping in nature. S1, S2, we all know you're going to have loud S1 in MS. There's no doubt about that. But it can be soft. Can be soft in various situations. We didn't discuss that, right? I told you MRTR will cause soft S1. But another important cause of soft S1 is calcified valve. Calcified valve. Any valve which is calcified is going to produce soft S1 only. So the best example for that is MS itself. As the valve begins to calcify more and more, your uh, S1 is going to become soft. So what are the cause of soft S1 in MS? Number one, calcified valve. 
Number two, associated MR. Because if you have associated MR along with RHD, you will have a softest one only. And patients were having uh, long PR interval. Patients are having extreme bradycardia. Patients rarely are having heart failure. For in these situations, all S1 can be soft. It need not be always loud. What are the extra sounds? Extra sound, most important is opening snap. So we know that opening, yes, there is something called S2OS gap. S2 or we can call it as A2OS gap, which is inversely proportional to severity. This A2OS gap or S2OS gap is inversely proportional to severity, which means if the gap is small, severity is more. Very, very important point. Murmur wise, it's a low pitched rough rumbling, mid diastolic murmur with characteristic pre systolic. Mid-diastolic and in the late because atrial contact is situated. The manner is No, actually, uh, the problem is uh, my network is good only, but uh, something suddenly, suddenly is actually uh, creating an issue. I don't know why. Anyways, sorry for that. So, where you guys heard last? Where you guys heard last? Come on guys, where you guys heard last? Can you see and hear me? Can you see and hear me? Guys? Okay. All right. Uh, where you are hearing? MS MDM. Okay. I told you, you know, there is a mid diastolic murmur, and that will be having one the characteristic pre systolic accentuation. Right. So, this is a typical mid diastolic murmur, and they're going to have one the typical pre systolic accentuation. The pre systolic accentuation will be there. That's characteristic. This is called PSA, right? Pre-systolic accentuation. And this pre-systolic accentuation will be due to atrial contraction. Atrial contraction. That atrial kick is the one that's going to produce that typical pre-systolic accentuation that increase in the supposed intensity of the murmur just before the systole. It occurs just before the systole because after S1, it's the systole, right? So just before the systole, it occurs. That's why it's called pre-systolic accentuation. That's so characteristic. And remember, this pre-systolic accentuation will be lost in atrial fibrillation. Once the patient develops atrial fibrillation, this pre-systolic accentuation will be lost. And second, MR, that is mitral regurgitation. So MR has multiple causes, but in exam, you will get only chronic MR. So what is the pulse in a chronic MR? It will be hyperkinetic because of brisk contraction. The pulse will be hyperkinetic, but the volume of the pulse overall will be normal. 
because MR has two outlets. I mean, the ventricle has two outlets in MR. One into aorta, back into the left atrium, second outlet. So, the volume will be normal, but because of forcible contraction, it will be brisk. So, that's why I'm calling hyperkinetic with normal volume. JP will be fairly normal. Epical impulse will be displaced down and out, and it will be hyperdynamic in nature. Hyperdynamic in nature. And S1 will be obviously soft. There's no doubt about that. In severe cases, white splitting of the second heart sound. And if you look at the extra sounds, the most important extra sound is going to be the third heart sound. Most of the case of MR will be having third heart sound because of ventricular volume overload. Murmur wise, it's a pan systolic murmur that's going to radiate to axilla. Pan systolic murmur that's going to radiate to axilla, best heard in the apex. Obviously, even MD murmur will be best heard in the apex. Right. Coming to aortic stenosis. There are only two important causes of aortic stenosis. One is old age aortic stenosis will be due to calcification and degeneration. Second, in young patients, it will be due to bicuspid aortic valve. So these are the usual reasons of aortic stenosis. Because it's a stenotic lesion, pulse will be hypokinetic and you're going to have low volume pulse only. And the characteristic pulse that is described in AS is pulses parvus at tardis. Parvus means small pulse at tardis. Again, a retarded pulse. That's why we call it as pulses parvus at tardis. And most of the times, you will have a prominent anacrotic notch. AS is one of the important cause of prominent anacrotic notch. That is also sometimes referred to as anacrotic pulse. So they will have a prominent anacrotic notch. And what about the JAP? Fairly normal. Epical impulse, non displaced, and it will be heaving in nature because here I told you the muscles will be like Arnold Schwarzenegger. So it will be very forcible contraction. So there will be a heaving epical impulse. In If you look at the X, S1 and S2, S1 will be fairly normal. There won't be a problem in S1. If you look at S2, S2 can be, uh, they can have a soft, I mean, S2 intensity will be variable. If you look at A2 intensity, A2 can be soft or it can be normal depending on the situation. So if it's a bicuspidatic valve, then A2 can be normal sometimes, but if it's a calcified valve, A2 will be soft only. And S2 may be split narrow because of LVOT obstruction, one of the important causes of narrow split, or in very severe cases, it can be paradoxically split as well. It can be narrowly split or it can be paradoxically split. We discussed that already. And the most important extra sound is fourth heart sound plus or minus patients can have ejection click. I told you ejection click is most commonly heard in bicuspid aortic valve. And murmur wise, it's an ejection systolic murmur typically heard in right upper sternal border. It will be a crescendo, decrescendo, diamond shaped murmur and it's going to radiate to both carotids. There will be radiation to both the carotids. So this is a typical murmur of aortic stenosis. Coming to aortic regurgitation. In aortic regurgitation, pulse will be obviously hyperkinetic. And unlike MR, the volume also will be large because all the blood is ejected into the aorta only. So there will be a large volume pulse. And the typical feature is, it's also called as pulses magnus. The other name for AR pulse is pulses magnus because of the high volume. And patients also tend to develop bisphyrians pulse bisphyrians pulse and it will be collapsing in nature this collapsing nature of ar pulse is also called as watson's water hammer pulse what is collapsing pulse it's rapid rise rapid fall also called as watson's water hammer pulse and uh, apart from this if you ask me the bp systolic bp of these patients will be very high but the diastolic bp of these patients will be extremely low sometimes it can even hit zero in the mercury sigma manometer so this will lead to extremely high pulse pressure. This will lead to extremely high pulse pressure. So that's why the pulse of these patients will be bounding. Extremely bounding pulse because of the high pulse pressure. So these are characteristic features of AR pulse. JEP will be fairly normal because of volume overload state. Epical pulse will be displaced and it will be hyperdynamic in nature just like your MR. And if you look at the S1, S1 will be normal. It won't be affected. If you look at S2, A2 may be soft or A2 may be normal. 
suppose if you have a valve related cause a2 will be soft only but if the problem is in the aortic root like marfan syndrome or syphilis the typical example of aortic root causing ar will be marfan syndrome and syphilis so in those conditions and all a2 can be normal or even loud guidelines say that a2 can i mean the books say a2 can be even normal or even it can be loud also if it's a root related problem like marfan syndrome and syphilis but if it's a valve problem it will be usually soft only because of damage to the valve and what is the most important sound that is the third heart sound very very common in patients with chronic ear the classic murmur is early diastolic murmur that is heard in the ups area ups point ups point is left to middle sternal border left upper sternal border is second intercostal space left to lower sternal border is fourth and fifth intercostal space left to middle sternal border is the ups point that is left to third intercostal space so that's where you classically hear the ar murmur and it won't be like kind of radiating anywhere it will be staying in the same place only most of the ar murmurs okay so these are the summary of the valar heart disease okay now let us move on to important cardiomyopathy in that the most important cardiomyopathy that you need to know is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that's the most important thing that you need to know have you understood whatever i taught taught you so far i mean it's a very quick recap i think in 2 hours time we have done so much almost just we have not even crossed 2 hours right we have done so much in 2 hours so let us try the same pace and try to finish off as much as possible today so now coming to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy or hcm so you know hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is nothing but unexplained unexplained lv hypertrophy unexplained lv hypertrophy if you cannot explain the reason for lv hypertrophy that is hcm and usually the lv thickness will be more than 15 mm by definition normal lv thickness is 9 to 10 mm normal lv thickness 9 to 10 mm if it's more than 15 mm very likely it will be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy only most of the cases will be genetic i mean genetically inherited so the most common mode of inheritance is autosomal dominant fashion and we have two important genes that are responsible for 70% cases one is mbh7 which is going to give rise to a protein called as beta myosin heavy chain mbh7 which is going to give rise to beta myosin heavy chain and second we have something called c mybpc c mybpc which is cardiac myosin binding protein c c mybpc that is cardiac myosin binding protein c these two alone are responsible for 70% plus cases of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy so how they are going to present and if they ask you the pathology pathology only three things myocyte hypertrophy there will be hypertrophy of myocytes second is fibrosis in the interstitium third is there will be disarray myocyte disarray so among all the most important point is myocyte disarray so myocyte hypertrophy myocyte fibrosis myocyte disarray in that as i said the most important is going to be the myocyte disarray very very important and coming to the presentation so majority of these patients can be asymptomatic completely asymptomatic or few minority of patients can be symptomatic if they are symptomatic they are going to present with symptom of heart failure one important symptom is heart failure and this heart failure will be of preserved ejection fraction very very important it's not of reduced ejection fraction it will be preserved ejection fraction where the ef will be normal or even it can be increased ejection fraction but they will have heart failure and that is predominantly because of problem in the diastole because they cannot fill the blood properly because again the heart will be like arnold schwarzenegger the muscles will be very thick blood cannot enter properly filling defect and uh, second they can develop syncopan sudden death syncopan sudden death especially during exertion if they ask you when they will develop syncopan sudden death most of them will be young athletes die during exertion and you all know that hcm is the most common cause of sudden death in young adults most common cause of sudden death in young adults hcm very very important point and most of them will die during exertion that is because during exertion the lvot obstruction will increase even further and syncope death will be due to ventricular arrhythmias like vtvf 
if they die due to syncope and death, if they, if they are getting syncope or if they die, it's due to ventricular arrhythmias only. So what are the important clinical signs that you expect in HCM? One typical kind of pulse that we see is bisphereans pulse. Classic and bisphereans will have a spike and dome appearance. Unlike your aortic regurgitation, you will have a classic spike and dome appearance. That word is very, very important. That's called a spike and dome pulse. And apart from bisphereans pulse, the another point is they will have a classic ejection systolic murmur because of outflow tract obstruction. And this will be heard in the herbs point or in the left lower sternal border. Either in the herbs point or it can be heard in the left lower sternal border. And this ejection systolic murmur will be very, very dynamic in nature. Very, very dynamic in nature. So that is because the LVOT obstruction, the LVOT obstruction that you see in HCM is dynamic. Because the LVOT obstruction is dynamic, the murmur also will be dynamic and it will be varying with LVOT obstruction. So I can say that LVOT obstruction is directly proportional to contractility, which means if the contractility increases, obstruction increases, murmur increases. The contractility decreases, obstruction decreases, murmur decreases. Simple. And it is inversely proportional to the load, which means if the load increases, murmur decreases. If the load decreases, murmur increases. And it's inversely proportional to the load. So what are the conditions that increase cardiac contractility? Cardiac contractility is going to increase with exercise. That's why most of the patients are going to develop severe LVOT obstruction during exercise because increased contractility, increased obstruction, worsening of the murmur, and they will die because of worsening obstruction. Exercise is a classic condition. Or inotropes. Use of inotropes, like for example, DIG, digoxin, can result in uh, more and more contractility and worsening LVOT obstruction. So what about the load? Load means we are talking about preload and afterload. Reduced load will increase obstruction and increased load will reduce obstruction. So what are the conditions that reduces the load? We have two loads. One is reduced preload and second is reduced afterload. So what conditions are going to reduce preload? Reduced preload will be seen with Valsalva. The most important maneuver is Valsalva. Very, very important. This is where you are going to increase the intrathoracic pressure and reduce the preload. Apart from Valsalva, there are many other conditions that can reduce the preload. Like uh, standing. That's called a squat to stand maneuver. Squat to stand maneuver and use of drugs like diuretics. And use of drugs like diuretics. Even diuretics and yes, nitroglycerin nitroglycerin diuretics, all these drugs also are going to reduce the preload, which in turn is going to worsen the obstruction. And there are drugs that can reduce the afterload. So what is going to reduce the afterload? Reduction of the afterload can be seen with drugs like amyl nitrate inhalation. Amyl nitrate inhalation, this is what is more important for exams. Amyl nitrate inhalation, but yes, many of you are correct. It can also occur with what? AC inhibitors, ARBs, hydralazine, nitroprusside. So any of these drugs can cause vasodilation and they can reduce the afterload. But important is amyl nitrate. So when it comes to increased load, we can either have increased preload or increased afterload. What are the conditions that's going to increase the preload? Two important conditions. One is squatting. Most important. Second, we can say leg raising. Like racing. So, but here the most important thing is squatting. Squatting is going to increase the preload and leg racing. What is going to increase afterload? Isometric hand grip. Isometric hand grip is going to increase afterload, thereby reducing the murmur. This is again a very important point. Isometric hand grip. So, the four most important thing is valsalva, amyl nitrate, squatting, isometric hand grip. Please don't forget these four. Other things, okay, fine, you can forget, but these four you cannot forget. In that at least Valsalva squatting is the least minimum that you have to know. Valsalva increases, squatting decreases. That much you should know at least. So these are the dynamic variations. And what about ECG? In ECG, all you are going to see is left ventricular hypertrophy. And in exam, they might give a clue called as dagger-like septal QVS. They can give a clue called as dagger-like septal QVS. So these septal QVS are due to septal contraction, septal firing. 
so they will be very very big and they'll be sharp that's called as dagger like septal cuboids very very important point and these cuboids are the ones that are going to create a pattern called a pseudo infarction pattern as well in echocardiogram you will see lvh lvot obstruction and you can prove that this lvot obstruction is dynamic in nature and another important point that is traditionally asked in exam is sam of aml that is systolic anterior motion of anterior mitral leaflet that is sam of aml abnormal systolic anterior motion of anterior mitral leaflet what's going to be the treatment of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy it depends on whether you're dealing with heart failure or you want to reduce the risk of sudden death if you want to reduce the risk of sudden death the only option is going to be icd that is implantable cardioverter defibrillator that is the only option if they ask you indications of implantable cardioverter defibrillator three indications are there lvh size more than 3 cm number 2 which means 30 mm plus thickness of lvh huge lv that is number 1 number 2 unexplained syncope unexplained syncope we assume that these syncopal episodes must be due to undetected vtvf that's why risk is very high third is family history of sudden death already somebody has died in the family due to hcm or unknowingly so this is another indication for icd heart failure wise the first choice is always beta blockers if they ask you alternative of course in asthma cobd patients you can use non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers like verapamil diltiazem and in case if the patient is not responding to initial therapy then you can add a drug called as disopyramine disopyramine which is a class 1c drug very very extensively studied in the setting of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy the pain is still not responding and if the patient is persistently symptomatic then you can do something called septal reduction therapy which includes resecting the septum that's called myomectomy or you can go for alcoholic septal ablation so that is what we called as septal reduction therapy so that's about hcm easy one and we have some two special dcms one is takats book cardiomyopathy second is going to be your myocarditis when it comes to takats book cardiomyopathy the other name for takats book is stress cardiomyopathy and we know that majority of these patients will be post menopausal females females who are 50 plus they are the ones that usually develop takats book cardiomyopathy right stress cardiomyopathy always called as broken heart syndrome always called as broken heart syndrome there are a lot of mechanisms for development of takats book cardiomyopathy but the main mechanism is myocardial stunning because of sudden emotions there will be myocardial stunning that is the only pathophysiology that you have to know as far as takats book cardiomyopathy is concerned and as expected most of the patients will be having history of some stressful event will be there it can be emotional stress or it can be physical stress whatever so it can be some fracture or it can be um death of loved ones some stress will be there and after that there will be myocardial stunning and that will result in dilation of the heart and heart failure and how these patients present they will have a mi like presentation classic mi like presentation where patient will be having chest pain plus or minus heart failure and if you look at the ecg patients will have st elevation and you will think it's a clear cut stemi and uh, if you see troponins troponins can be normal or it can be mildly elevated because here the damage is not there it's only stunning which means myocardium is just stunned it's not dead so there will be a very mild elevation of troponin or it can be completely normal echocardiogram will give you a clue echocardiogram will show regional wall motion abnormality but in a non coronary distribution will show in a non coronary distribution typically most commonly in the apex there will be ballooning dilatation of the apex that's why this is also called as epical ballooning syndrome and this form of stress cardiomyopathy is what we call as takats book cardiomyopathy this form of stress cardiomyopathy is what we call as takats book cardiomyopathy so in exam it's not uncommon that you get a ventriculography image like this like for example in diastole everything will look fine but in systole you can notice that the apex is not contracting at all it just ballooned out apex is not contracting only the base of the heart is contracting so this looks like a jar that is used to catch the octopus isn't it so that's why this is called as takatsubo cardiomyopathy epical ballooning syndrome 
and ultimately you have to think about STEMI only. You will push the patient to cath lab, go for a coronary angiogram and prove that the coronary angiogram is normal. So you know that the coronary angiogram is going to be normal. There will be no lesion. That is the ultimate confirmatory point for Takat's book anemopathy. Treatment is conservative only. Treatment is conservative. No big deal. Mortality is around like 3-5 percentage like type 1 MI. Treatment is conservative. And uh, what one drug that you should avoid is dopotamine. They have asked this question so many times. Don't give dopotamine. Not all inotropes. Dopotamine especially is contraindicated for various reasons. Because of LVOT obstruction that can be seen in these patients. No dopotamine. Another important dilated cardiomyopathy is myocarditis. Myocarditis, which is a very important cause of dilated cardiomyopathy, right? So usually in exam, there will be history of viral prodrome. Whenever the examiner wants you to diagnose myocarditis, there will be a history of some viral prodrome. Okay? So after this, patients will be presenting predominantly with heart failure. Viral prodrome means usually it will be URA symptoms. And after that, patients will be developing heart failure after some point of time. Maybe after a few weeks or a few months. So this viral prodrome is because the most common cause of myocarditis is viral. In that, parovirus B19 is the most common. Followed by human herpes virus 6. These two viruses are supposed to be the most common cause of viral myocarditis. And heart failure will be there. And if you look at ECG, there will be non-specific STD changes. STD changes. And if you look at echocardiogram, it can be ST depression, TV inversion and all. But if they ask you the most common ECG change, it is sinus tachycardia. Most common ECG change, sinus tachycardia. If you look at echocardiogram, there will be again no clear clue. Global LV dysfunction will be there. And EF will be definitely low. EF will be reduced. There will be global LV dysfunction. There won't be any specific regional wall motion abnormality. If you are doubt, I mean if you took a troponin, Proponents will be definitely elevated. And if you have a doubt that it's MI and if you do a coronary angiogram, it will be normal as well. Because the problem is myocardial injury and not I mean vessel damage. And the problem with myocarditis is these investigations are not going to 100% certainly tell you that you're dealing with the myocarditis. That's the reason if they ask you gold standard, it is biopsy. Biopsy is the ultimate gold standard. What are you going to see in biopsy? You are going to see lymphocyte infiltration like what you are seeing here. Along with that, there will be evidence of damage to the myocytes. So this is what we call as the Dallas criteria for definite myocarditis. Dallas criteria. But the problem with endomyocardial biopsy is the fact that it's very, very poorly sensitive. Only 5% sensitive. That's why a good alternative or alternative investigation of choice is going to be cardiac MRI. Cardiac magnetic resonance, where you can uh, use a criteria called as Lake Lewis criteria. Lake Lewis criteria. It is based on early and late gadolinium enhancements. Treatment of choice is supportive. Just go for supportive management, nothing else. Coming to pericardial disorders, there are two important pericardial disorders as, a, as far as we know. So one is going to be your um, acute pericarditis and second one is going to be cardiac tamponade. First one is acute pericarditis, second is cardiac tamponade. In acute pericarditis, once again, the most important clue will be history of some viral prodrome, like URA will be there, most of the cases. Viral prodrome will be there and after this viral prodrome, they will develop chest pain and not Heart failure, very important point. So viral prodrome followed by heart failure, think about myocarditis. Viral prodrome followed by chest pain, think about acute pericarditis. And at this point, you all must be knowing that this chest pain is going to be pleuritic in nature, pleuritic in nature, and it's going to be relieved on leaning forward position. Leaning forward position. Right. And you are going to do ECG. And usually one important associated clinical sign will be there will be pleural drug. Pleural drug can be heard as well on auscultation. And on ECG, you will see ST elevation. 
which will be global, multifocal, many different places you will see ST elevation. Along with that, there will be PR segment depression and there will be concave and saddleback. There will be concave, otherwise called as saddleback ST elevations, concave ST elevations, not convex tombstone elevations like myocardial infarction. And if you do troponins, it will be fairly normal. If you do echocardiogram also, it will be fairly normal. In the sense, there could be mild pericardial effusion. Mild pericardial effusion, common. But otherwise, in most situations, it will be fairly normal. LB function will be normal at least. Okay, troponins will be normal. So this will confirm that you are dealing with a case of acute pericarditis. Because what more you want? Everything is like spoon-fed. And if they ask you, what will you do for treatment? Treatment of acute pericarditis, first NSAID. Same like gout, first give NSAIDs. Along with that, commonly we add colchicine to reduce the risk of relapse because pericarditis can keep coming again and again. In case if they ask you alternatives to NSAIDs, if NSAIDs cannot be used, maybe because of peptic ulcer disease or GI bleeding or the patient is having renal failure where you cannot use NSAIDs, then steroids will be alternative, corticosteroids or anti-IL-1 therapy like anakinra and kenakimumab. What are the anti-IL-1? Anakinra and can I give them? So these are the other alternatives in the setting of acute pericarditis. If you look at this ECG, it's quite obvious. There are lots of ST elevations you can see here, you can see here, you can see here, here, here. You can see a little bit here, a little bit here. So there are multifocal ST elevations distributed in multiple different places. And along with that, there is a clear-cut evidence of PR segment depression. The PR segment is depressed. The only lead where PR segment can be elevated is AVR, which is nothing but the opposite of your, whatever waveform that you see in your routine ECG. So PR depression is there, but in AVR alone, PR elevation may be there and patients are going to have ST elevation and there won't be any reciprocal ST depressions. And these elevations are more concave in nature. You can see these elevations are more concave in nature. These are also called as saddleback ST segment elevations. So that completes our acute pericarditis as well, coming to cardiac tamponade. Yeah, ECG with some history will be given usually. Generally, they don't give ECG without history unless until it's a clear-cut spotter. Okay, now cardiac tamponade. So what about cardiac tamponade? Cardiac tamponade patients usually will be having history of some cancer or some trauma to the chest. Generally, they'll give some history like this. Cancer in the sense, uh, they will talk about uh, cancer of the mediastinum, like not small cell lung cancer or some lymphoma. Some mediastinal cancer will be there or there will be history of some trauma. So, how the patient will be present? They will present the characteristic triad. So, what is the triad called as? Beck triad. According to Beck triad, patients will be having jugular venous distension, patients will be hypotension, having hypotension, and patients will be having distant heart sounds, or otherwise called as muffled heart sounds. This is a typical triad of tamponade. Right? This is also called as Beck's triad. But most patients will have tachycardia and tachypnea. In fact, they will be having severe tachycardia and tachypnea. And most patients will be having another important sign called as pulses paradoxes. Pulses, paradoxes. So, you know, normally during inspiration, the BP decreases. But how much it should decrease? Only 3 to 5 millimeters of mercury. But if the inspiratory fall in systolic BP is more than 10 millimeters of mercury, we can call it as pulses paradoxes. If the inspiratory fall in BP is more than 10 millimeters of mercury, we call it as pulses paradoxes. And very, very important finding. If they ask you another area where you can hear, see pulses paradoxes is in acute exacerbation of bronchial asthma and COPD, or we can say acute severe asthma. These two are very, very important cause of pulses paradoxes. That is acute exacerbation of bronchial asthma and COPD or acute severe asthma. And if you do ECG, in ECG, the usual finding will be sinus tachycardia, but one important finding that examiner tends to give is electrical alternates. Electrical alternance. So what do you mean by electrical alternance? There will be something called beat-to-beat -beat variability in QRS amplitude and QRS axis. 
if you look at lead two, you can clearly see that there is beat to beat variability in QRS amplitude. So one beat is big, one beat is small, big, small, big, small, like that is there. No? So that's why uh, this is called as electrical alternance. And remember, the moment you know it's tamponade, you have to start with therapy. Treatment will be with IV fluid plus you can give pericardial synthesis. But if you want one answer, answer will be definitely pericardial synthesis. That's the most important. We usually follow a subzified process. Subzified process, like the needle will be inserted under the zified process at a 30 degree angle and directed towards the left shoulder. Needle, 30 degree angle, subzified direct towards the left shoulder you get um get into the pericardial space near the right ventricle and aspirate the fluid even aspiration of 100 150 ml may be life-saving at that point of time so that's the best treatment in the setting of cardiac tamper echo can be done but echo will show that characteristic diastolic rirv collapse that is not important for fmg exams to be honest so that is typical of uh, cardiac tamperant. And another thing, we didn't talk about the JVP, right? This is important. In JVP, um, you will have a prominent X descent but a blunted Y descent. That's very, very important. The X descent will be prominent but the Y descent will be blunted. That's another very important finding in cardiac tamperant. And one other finding is that that's called Kusmal sign. Kusmal sign will be seen in constricted pericarditis. Normally, JVP also decreases during inspiration. If it doesn't have any respiratory variation or if the JVP increases with inspiration, that's called Kusmal sign and it's commonly seen in cardiac tamponade. Sorry, constrictive pericarditis. So in exam, be very clear. Pulses paradoxes means tamponade. Kusmal sign means constrictive pericarditis. That's it. You have to be very clear about that. Even though there are overlaps, but this is how exam goes. Clear. I think only few more topics are there. Only one more is there, no? We can finish dissection also soon. So now, how to treat a patient with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction? Because we don't have treatment for preserved ejection fraction. We use the same treatment for preserved ejection fraction, but no drug has shown to improve survival in patients with preserved ejection fraction. The only thing that has been shown to improve survival, I mean, the drugs have been shown to improve survival only in the setting of heart failure and reduced ejection fraction, not with preserved ejection fraction. So that's why I'm talking only about management of chronic HFRU. So what are the most important drugs? The most important drugs is going to be in the step one therapy. There are five drugs I'm going to add. Okay, there are five drugs I'm going to add in the step one, or we can say the most useful drugs. In management of HFRF, what are the most useful drugs are the frontline drugs therapy. Drug number one is RNA. That is angiotensin receptor nebulous inhibitor, which is nothing but sacubitril, valsatin combination. Sacubitril is a nebulous inhibitor, valsatin is an angiotensin receptor blocker. And definitely this is better than your traditional ACE inhibitors and ARBs. So if you ask me ACE inhibitors, ARBs versus RNAs, which is better, 100% answer is RNAs. Succubital valsatin. And what about ACE inhibitors and ARBs? They are equal. There is no difference between ACE inhibitors and ARBs, but the first choice must be these drugs only. There is no other drug. And um, there was an old RNA, I mean, an old drug in 2013, they withdrawn. That's called as omapatrelet. Omapatrelet, this was the old drug. They withdraw from withdrawn in 2013 itself because this caused high risk of angioedema. There are lots and lots of patients who had angioedema because of omapatrelet. So they withdrawn this drug from the market. This is also an RNA. But the beautiful thing about this omapatrelet is it's a dual nepralesin inhibitor and ARB, which means here you have two drugs, succubital, valsatin separately. But both these things are performed by one drug, that is omapatrelet. That's why it's called a dual ARB and an epilase inhibitor. Clear? So that can be asked in exam. Even though it's withdrawn from the market, there's a high possibility that these kind of questions can come in exam. So that is omapatrelet. So apart from RNA, the second drug that I can choose is beta blockers. In beta blockers, we have the MBC group of drugs. We have the metoprolol, bisoprolol, carbidilol. MBC, metoprolol, bisoprolol, carbidilol. Third, we have MRS. 
these are mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists we have two drugs in that spironolactone and epidrenone both have equal efficacy spironolactone and epidrenone okay among the beta blockers if you ask me which is better carbidolol overall better is arni only then followed by acinimitri arbis next is beta blocker among the beta blocker carbidolol then we have mri in mri there is no difference spironolactone is equal to epidrenone and then we have the SGLT2 inhibitor. In SGLT2 inhibitor, the two most important drugs is going to be Dapagliflozin and Empagliflozin. Both Dapa and Empa are kind of equal. Okay, Dapagliflozin and Empagliflozin. So these are the most useful drugs in the setting of heart failure. Along with that, in case if there is any congestive symptom, in case of any congestive symptom, like for example, patient is having edema, patient is having jugular venous distension, patient is having ascites, pleural effusions, you can add diuretics. In practice, whenever you say diuretics, it's going to be loop plus or minus thiazine diuretics. Loop plus or minus thiazide diuretics, like furosemide and chlorothalidone or hydrochlorothiazide. Some thiazide you can add if you want. But the first choice is loop plus or minus thiazide diuretics. But this can be added only if the patient is congested otherwise we don't add so these are the drugs that improve survival there is another drug that has been shown to improve survival that is hisdn hisdn but this has been shown to improve survival only in blacks this is a combination of hydralazine and isdn that has been shown to improve survival only in blacks in black population not in white population and what are the drugs that have no effect on survival? No effect on survival. Number one, diuretics. Diuretics have no effect on survival whatsoever. Number two, uh, CCBs, calcium channel blockers, have no effect on survival. Number three, nitrates. Nitrates alone have no effect on survival. Number four, digoxin. Number five, Ivabradin. Number six, there is a drug called Verisigvat. Verisigvat. None of these drugs have improvement in survival. They improve symptoms, but they don't have effect on survival. They don't have any benefit on cardiac remodeling. Okay, because cardiac remodeling is the reason for progressive heart failure. They don't alter that. That's why they don't affect survival at all. No change in survival. Diuretic means I'm talking about loop and thiazide. CCBs means all CCBs, dietoperidin, non-troperidin, whatever. Nitrates alone, digoxin, ivabradin. You know, ivabradin works by inhibiting the funny current. Right? It's a funny current inhibitor. And finally, we have verisigvat. Verisigvat is a soluble gonadotropin cyclase activator, like riosigvat. So these drugs have no effect on survival. Very, very important. Even though used in heart failure sometimes, but you have to be very clear, no benefit on survival. These are the only five beneficial drugs in patients with heart failure. Okay. Now going to a miscellaneous topic called aortic dissection. So another, this is a final topic actually in cardiology. So that's kind of aortic dissection. Very, very important topic. So one question generally you can expect from dissection. So usual, most common risk factor for dissection is Hypertension. Hypertension is the number one risk factor, most common risk factor. But in exam, don't forget about Marfan syndrome and other aortic disorders. Aortic disorders like Takai's arteritis, coarctation of aorta, other thing also can cause Marfan syndrome. Second step, um, I mean, I'm just going with the PYQs. As per the PYQs, in NEAT PG and FMG level, they have not asked about the ICD and CRT. That's why I have not discussed about that. Usually ICD and CRT are INACT questions. Probably that's the reason I have not discussed much about it. Maybe once in need they ask, but you ask of no in FMG, they have never touched the second step. That is the CRT and the ICD step. I think you have seen the notes or probably have attended the class before. So that's why you're asking that I understand. But anyway, that's not important. These drugs are going to be the most important. What drugs that improve survival and what drugs that don't improve survival and what drugs that affect the remodeling and what drugs that don't affect the remodeling. So that is what is going to be more important. Okay. So 
Coming to hybrid dissection again, so the most common risk factor I told you is hypertension. Most of the patients will be hypertensives. And there are other risk factors also like Marfan's and aortic disorders like tachycardia and coarctation of aorta. So aortic dissection, whom it will present. Classically, most of the patients in acute aortic dissection will be complaining of chest pain. This chest pain will be having a tearing or a ripping quality. Tearing or ripping quality of chest pain. And more importantly, this pain will radiate to back. That is the intrascapular region. It will radiate to the back between the two shoulder blades. That's classic of aortic dissection. And what you will do, you will examine the patient. You will examine for complications. Because aortic dissection can produce complications. So examine for complications. So... Dissection is something that can extend proximally back into the heart or it can extend distally into the aortic arch also. But if they ask you the most common site of dissection, it is ascending aorta. Ascending aorta is the most common site of dissection. So examine for complications. So what complications you want to examine for? Number one, patients can have tamponade because some portion of aorta is covered with pericardium. If it uh, dissection extends proximally, it leaks it'll blood into the pericardium causing tamponade. So you will have the big striat there. And if the root is dilated, patients can develop acute aortic regurgitation. The aortic root becomes dilated. They are going to result in acute aortic regurgitation and this can lead to acute heart failure. And that can kill the patient. And number three, patients can uh, have MI, a frank myocardial infarction. And that is because the coronary arteries are coming from the root of the aorta. So if the dissection extends proximally, that one of the arteries can be blocked. But if they ask you which artery will be blocked, RCA will be blocked more commonly than LCA. So inferior MI is more common than anterior MI. Because usually dissection will start on the right lateral portion of the aorta only. So that's the reason why RCA is commonly affected. So these are three deadly complications where the patient can be hypotensive. And next... If the dissection extends distally, you might get subclavian involvement. Subclavian artery can be involved. If subclavian artery is affected on one side, you will result in arm pain and arm claudication. Plus, there will be unequal pulse and BP between arms. Unequal pulse and blood pressure between arms. This is a very, 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 very important finding. Okay, Unequal pulse and BP between arms. Whenever in exam they mention acute chest pain with unequal pulse and BP between arms, it is dissection unless proved otherwise. Very important point. Next, they can develop TA and stroke also because if carotid vessels are involved, patients can develop TA and stroke because the carotid vessels are also in the arch of aorta only. So, I mean, vertebral artery also arises from subclavian. So there's a lot of problem. They can, they can develop both anterior circulation problem as well as posterior circulation problem. And they can develop left hemothorax because there is a close proximity of aorta with left to pleural space. So if the blood leaks into the left to pleural space, that can result in left to hemothorax. We have seen some cases like that. And patients can have other end organ failure also. So once you examine for complications, you're going to look at how to work up the case. How to work up the case. There are three options. Either you can do a CT angiogram or you can do a MR angiogram or just a chest MRI or you can do a transesophageal echo, depending on the situation. If you ask me, the most common investigation that is performed is CT angiogram because it's highly efficacious. Timing is also very short. But T is the one that is preferred if the patient is unstable. MRI, even though it is the theoretical gold standard, theoretically it's the gold standard, but it's very, very time consuming and it's not that helpful in acute situations. So that's why CT angiogram is the one that we follow first. In case if it's not possible, if the patient is unstable like hypotension and shock, you do transophageal echo because it can be done in the ICU even in intubated patients. Easy to do. Now we have worked up and know what is the type of dissection. How will you treat? Treatment will be depending on whether you are dealing with a Stanford A type dissection or Stanford B type. Stanford A means ascending aorta is involved. Stanford B means ascending aorta is not involved. That's all. If ascending aorta is involved, it is Stanford A. Not involved, Stanford B. Whatever may be the case, I need to stabilize the patient. 
because most of the patients will be having high BP, I have to keep a target. My target heart rate must be less than 60 and my target systolic blood pressure must be less than 120 millimeters of mercury. For this, I am going to give IV esmolol and for, followed by, for this I will give IV nitroprusside. So this is what exactly the guidelines say. Esmolol followed by nitroprusside. If you want one answer, you go for esmolol. If you want one answer, you can just go for esmolol and if they ask you alternative, it's going to be labetalol. If you don't have esmolol, yes, because in India we don't have esmolol, in that case alternative will be labetalol. And apart from that, all patients with Stanford A will be undergoing surgery. Surgery for all. Even though conservative management stabilization is the same, but all Stanford A patients has to be taken versus Stanford B, only selected patients will be taken up for surgery. And here is a dissection. Uh, that is commonly seen here is the ascending aorta and here is the descending aorta. I think this is a dissection that is extending from ascending to the descending aorta. So it is an extensive dissection but still it will come under Stanford A only. And you can notice that the intimal flap, the torn intimal flap is like displaced to the center. That is the clincher. So this is also called as intimal flap and this sign is also called as tennis ball sign. This sign is also called as tennis ball sign. And uh, you have two lumens here. One is true lumen, which will always be the smaller, and then you have the false lumen, which will always be the bigger. The smaller one is always the true lumen. The bigger one is the false lumen. And this sign is what we call as tennis ball sign, and this is because of displacement of intimal flap. Okay. I think we have completed as much as possible. Okay. In the cardiology section, I think we have completed. How many time we have to? Yeah, two and a half hours. Yeah, we have time. But anyway, so we'll, let's go at the same pace. You want 10 minutes break? Lunch break at this time, huh? In two and a half hours. Now you want lunch break. Okay, maybe you can take five minutes break. Maybe 12.55 now, no? You can take till one o'clock. Five minutes break, okay. Then we'll uh, give a break at two o'clock again. Two, two, ten, I'll give.
Hey guys, welcome back. Are you all there? Shall we proceed? Yeah, I'm better now. Nothing guys, I didn't get a tablet. Actually, I asked one of my uh, person to go and get a tablet and come. So that's why it took a little bit of time. Nothing else. Okay. Huh. Let us start with abnormal flow volume loops, FE loops. How was POQ sessions? Yeah, we did a good job on POQ sessions. I think in three years POQ, starting from 2021, 22, 23. So three years POQ sessions were there. And in medicine as such, I think every uh, paper had 30 questions around. So we have around 150 questions for FMG. It's quite good, actually. You can go through if you want with good explanations. And, and we made sure that the sessions are not uh, that elaborative as well. So we made it like in a very correct way, like 40, 45 minutes for each paper in medicine so that uh, you don't need to waste like days of time only for the PYQs. It'll be uploaded soon. No need to worry about that. So for medicine as such, the total duration that you have to spend is around four to four and a half hours. That's it. So you get all the five to six, I think five papers we have done starting from 2021. So all five papers spend just four hours, four, four hours, 15 minutes. That's enough. Okay. So let us go to discussion of other important topics. Okay. Now we have the abnormal flow volume loops, right? So what are the important abnormal flow volume loops? First, we are talking about the small airways disease. Small airways obstructive lung disease. Small airways obstructive lung disease where the loop will show that characteristic coving will be there. So that is basically suggested for small airways obstructive lung disease. And then you have loop like this where compared to the normal loop in the background, the loop will be small. Okay, the loop will be small. You know that in the flow volume loop, this area is forced vital capacity. That entire like horizontal line is forced vital capacity. Here you can see that the FVC is the one that is reduced so much. There is significant reduction in forced vital capacity. Apart from that, the shape of the loop as such is normal. The shape of the loop as such is normal, which is very much suggestive of restrictive lung disease. And on the other hand, if you look at this patient, this patient is having coving. This patient is having coving also. Along with that, this patient is having reduction in post vital capacity also. Post vital capacity is also reduced. So there are two possibilities here. One, it can be mixed obstruction and restriction. I can write mixed OLD and RLD. That's one possibility because coving is also there and FEC is also reduced. Or alternatively, you can uh, think about uh, pseudo restriction, which is not important at an FMG level. So no need to think about pseudo restriction. So this is very likely to be a mixed obstruction and restriction. And to find out large airways obstruction, we are going to look at flattening of one entire limb, large airways obstruction. So whenever there is flattening of one entire inspiratory and or expiratory limb, we are going to think about large airways obstruction. And in that, if only inspiration or expiration is affected, here only inspiration is affected, here only expiration is affected. If only inspiration or expiration is affected, this is likely to be a variable or we can call it as a dynamic large airways obstruction. Variable or dynamic large airways obstruction. But if you see uh, that both expression and inspiration, if it is flattened, it is likely to be a fixed obstruction. So whenever only one uh, phase of the respiration is affected, that is variable or dynamic. If only, if both the limbs are affected, both inspiratory and expiratory limbs are affected, it is a fixed obstruction. And in that, if intra, if inspiratory limb is affected, it's extrathoracic obstruction. If expiratory limb is affected, it is intrathoracic obstruction. That's all. Simple. So first of all, see whether the limb is flattened or not. If it's flattened, it's large airways obstruction. If only inspiration or expiratory limb is flattened, that must be dynamic. If both are affected, it's fixed. 
and see whether it's inspiration or expression which is affected. If inspiration is affected, it's extrathoracic large airways. In expression is affected means intrathoracic dynamic large airway obstruction. That's it. And how to approach a flow volume loop in exam? In a simple way. Always first see Fe1 by Fec. If Fe1 by Fec is normal, that is always suggestive of obstructive lung disease. Obstructive lung disease, that's all. If F1 by FEC is normal, that is obstructive lung disease. If F1 by FEC, sorry, is low, less than 70%, sorry, sorry. If the F1 by FEC is less than 70%, it is obstructive lung disease. If F1 by FEC is normal, that is more than 70%, then see FVC. Always see FVC. If FVC is reduced, if it is less than 80%, think about Restrictive lung disease. Always think about restrictive lung disease. FEC is low. And to confirm, you have to do total lung capacity. You have to confirm with TLC. For TLC, you don't, you cannot do with spirometry. You need other investing, uh, other uh, methods like body plethysmography. Confirm with TLC. In case if FEC is normal, FEC is also more than 80%. Next step is to look at DLCO. DLCO. If DLCO is reduced, if DLCO is less than 80%, think about pulmonary hypertension. Pulmonary hypertension. If DLCO is more than 80%, now you can say the patient is likely to have a normal pulmonary function. If you know if it's a restrictive lung disease, next step is to look at DLCO again. If DLCO is less than 80%, think about interstitial lung disease. If DLCO is more than 80%, think about neuromuscular disease like GBS, amyotropic lateral sclerosis and so on, like polio and all other things. And in case if you are dealing with an obstructive lung disease, now give a bronchodilator. Look for post-bronchodilator Fe1 by Fec. Post-bronchodilator Fe1 by Fec. If the post-bronchodilator Fe1 by Fec is more than or equal to 70%, more than equal to 70 percentage, it is likely to be bronchial asthma. If the pro post bronchiolitis F1 by FEC is less than 70 percentage, it is likely to be COPD. That is chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. If it improves to more than 70 percentage, it is bronchial asthma for sure. But you can also confirm bronchial asthma by looking at post bronchodilator FEV1. Post bronchodilator FEV1, it will increase by at least 12 percentage or more than 200 ml in absolute terms. Either 12 percentage in relative terms or more than 200 ml in absolute terms. If F1 by F1 increases by this much, it is likely to be bronchial asthma. Or if F1 by FEC increased to more than 70 percentage after bronchodilation, that is also likely bronchial asthma. And if the F1 by FEC doesn't increase uh, to less than I mean, more than 70 percentage after bronchodilator like salbutamol nebulization it is likely to be COPD. Clear? So this is a very elegant simple approach to PFT. So always see first step F1 by FEC different index less than 70 obstruction more than 70 C FEC. If FEC is low definitely it is restriction. If you know if it's obstruction see post bronchiolator F1 by FEC. If it's more than 70 it's bronchial asthma less than 70 COPD. In case if it's a bronchial asthma there will be other criteria like post bronchiolitis F1 increased by more than 12% and more than 200 ml. If you know it's an RLD, confirm with TLC if you want. Otherwise, you see DLCO. DLCO less than 80% is likely ILD. More than 80% is likely intramuscular disease. If DLCO is more, uh, if everything is normal, F1 by FEC normal, FEC is also normal, look at DLCO. DLCO is less than 80 means we are thinking about pulmonary hypertension. If DLCO more than 80% means we are thinking about a normal individual. Sometimes they might give a supranormal DLO, DLCO, like more than 120% DLCO. Think about diffuse alar hemorrhage. Like best example for that will be good pasture syndrome. They have given a supranormal DLCO like this, more than 120% and all. In exam, always think about good pasture syndrome. That is diffuse alveolar hemorrhage. Again, that's a common FMG level question only. So do you understand this? I've simplified it. That's all. I've not complicated anything. I just wanted to finish everything in a short span of time. That's why I've simplified and gave you in a very simple description. That's all. And this will contain all the information, whatever you need for your exams. Whatever you require, this will contain all the information. Okay. Now, 
how to manage acute exacerbation of bronchial asthma and COPD. Now you know bronchial asthma and COPD, right? How to treat the acute exacerbation of bronchial asthma. Acute exacerbation. So what are the manifestations of severe bronchial asthma? In case if it's a severe exacerbation, you are going to have resting shortness of breath. Resting shortness of breath. Patients will be having low saturation. SpO2 will be less than 90 percentage and patients will be having pulses paradoxes. Pulses paradoxes and patients will be unable to speak in full sentences. Patient will be unable to speak sentences or they may give something called silent chest where there won't be any air entry at all or they may give any hemodynamic instability, low BP, bradycardia, okay, any hemodynamic instability is a sign of severe asthma. So these are all basically what signs of severe asthma. Your neat PG examiners tend to be very simple. Okay, they are going to give any one of this only to say that the patient is having severe asthma. So in exam guidelines are not helpful. Okay, don't worry. Don't study any GINA guideline or whatever. They generally don't ask. So these are going to be the typical features of severe asthma. If the pain is having severe asthma, immediately you have to start with oxygen and bronchodilators. Immediately you have to start with oxygen and you will immediately start with bronchodilators as well. In asthma, the short-acting beta-2 agonists are going to be more important. Plus or minus, I can add SAMA. That is short-acting muscarinic antagonists. Short-acting beta-2 agonists like salbutamol, for example, or you can, plus or minus, you can give short-acting muscarinic antagonists like hypertropium. Hypertropium. So this is the commonest combination that we use. But generally start with Saba and move to Sama in case if it's very severe. So next step, once you are given oxygen and bronchodilators, next step is to start with corticosteroids. Very, very important. So you are going to give either IV prednisolone, oral prednisolone or IV methylprednisolone. Anyone you can try. It's a systemic corticosteroid. Then... Next step is to try and give some adjunctive therapy. Adjunctive therapy. So what are the most important adjunctive therapy? It is magnesium sulfate. Magnesium sulfate. IV magnesium sulfate can be tried in case if the patient doesn't respond properly. Finally, you can go for positive pressure ventilation if everything fails. This is the last step. Last resort. If everything fails, go for positive pressure ventilation like intubation. So this is the standard basic level management of acute exacerbation of bronchial asthma. So what about COPD? COPD, we have gold classification criteria. We didn't talk about that, right? So once you know it's COPD, look at FEV1 and we can say what severity they belong to. If it's gold 1, we can say the FEV1 will be more than 80 percentage. Gold 2, FEV1 will be 50 to 79 percentage. Gold 3, FEV1 will be 30 to 49 percentage. It's gold 4. F1 will be less than 30 percentage. F1 will be less than 30 percentage. So this is the gold severity. So once you know that the pain is having COPD, then you can find out what is the gold severity using F1 values. Now, how will you manage the acute exacerbation of COPD? Acute exacerbation of COPD. First, give oxygen and bronchodilators as usual. This is step number one. But here, oxygen should be carefully given and you should not target a very high SpO2. The SpO2 target must be 88 to 92 percentage. Too much of oxygen is also dangerous. During acute exacerbation of COPD, it can cause paradoxical CO2 retention. And what bronchodilator? Here, SAMA is going to be more important. Hypertropium. Plus or minus in severe cases, I can add SABA. And as usual, I'm going to add systemic corticosteroids, which can be either prednisolone oral or methylprednisolone IV. And there are some important and useful adjunctive therapy. Adjunctive therapy in patients with COPD, which are nothing but antibiotics. Antibiotics are important in COPD compared to asthma because the most common cause of acute exacerbation in COPD is infection. Infection is the number one cause of acute exacerbation of COPD, but asthma, it's usually not due to infection antibiotics, then you can try NIPPV. 
NIPP means recommendation is only for BiPAP. That is bi-level positive airway pressure. What NIPPV you can try? I mean, what is the indication for NIPPV in COPD? The pH should be less than 7.35 and or PSEO2 should be more than or equal to 45. So this is the indication for NIPPV in CPAP. pH less than or equal to 7.35 and or PSEO2 more than 45. You can start with bi-level positive area pressure. If it fails or if it doesn't work, you can go for endotracheal intubation, which is a form of invasive positive pressure ventilation. So that's how it is. And what are the contraindications for NIPPV? For any NIPPV, we have some standard contraindications. In NIPPV, standard contraindication will be low GCS. If the GCS is low, I cannot use NIPPV. If the patient is unstable, having low BP, shock, hemodynamic instability, I cannot use NIPPV. If the patient is vomiting, or if the patient is having upper gastrointestinal bleeding, UGA bleed, or the patient is having excessive secretions like in OPC poisoning. I cannot use because the risk of aspiration is very high. And acute myocardial infarction. Acute MI is also contraindication for NIPPV. Always look for the standard contraindications. If it's contraindicated, then intubation is the only choice. That is endotracheal intubation. So that covers the most important diseases, right? The Not only the spirometry, the asthma COPD part is also over to some extent. Coming to ARDS. In ARDS, they will usually ask about the new Berlin criteria only. So where you are going to have acute insult the um, lung, which is defined as insult in the last seven days. Second, patient should have bilateral infiltrates in imaging. Bilateral infiltrates in imaging, either CT or X-ray. Number three, patient will be having non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, which means the infiltrates should not be correlating with heart failure. Heart failure may be there, but that is not the only reason for infiltrates that you have to prove. Number four, patients should have severe hypoxemia. Severe hypoxemia. How will you prove severe hypoxemia? We can see something called PF ratio. That is nothing but PAO2, FAO2 ratio. PAO2 by FAO2 ratio. That's what you need to look at. In PF ratio, if the PF ratio is less than 300, it is ERDS. We call it as mild ERDS. If it is less than 200, it's called as moderate ERDS. If it is less than 100, we are going to call it as severe ERDS. And PF ratio should be calculated only with the PEEP of at least 5 centimeters of water. Very, very important point. Don't see PF ratio without calculating, without the patient being on PEEP of at least 5 centimeters of water. PEEP of 5 centimeters means we're talking about positive and expected pressure of at least 5 centimeters of water. So all four criteria should be satisfied. Then we can call it as ARDS. And remember the only thing that improves, this is a typical ARDS X-ray, the only thing that improves survival is low tidal volume ventilation. There is a tidal volume. This is the only thing that has been consistently proven to improve survival in patients with ARDS. What do you mean by low tidal volume ventilation? It is 4 to 6 ml per kilogram of ideal body weight. 4 to 6 ml per kilogram. Normally in the ICU, we prefer 8 to 10 ml per kilogram. That's standard. But when it comes to ARDS, you have to reduce and you have to use no more than 6 ml per kilogram. That's called low tidal volume ventilation. And there are six pieces of ARDS treatment. P number one is PEEP. Very, very important. It has to be titrated based on Titrate according to FAO2. You have to titrate according to FAO2. So see the FAO2 and titrate accordingly. There is a separate table for that. And second, we have paralysis. Especially in patients who are having ventilator patient dyssynchrony, paralysis is going to be very helpful. Number three, proning. If you want to be effective in proning process, it should be at least for 16 hours a day. Which means 16 hours prone, 8 hours erect. That's how we are going to keep the patient. And next is going to be peeing. Peeing. Peeing means we are talking about conservative fluid balance. Conservative fluid balance, which means patient can be euvolemic or maybe slightly hypovolemic, but definitely not hypervolemic. Hyper, definitely no. You can give pulmonary 
ஆக்சைடு லெட்டர்ஸ் லைக் இன்னியல் நைட்ரிக் ஆக்சைட் ஆர் ஐவி இப்போ ப்ரோஸ்டனால் And finally, perfusion. This is the last resort. If you, nothing else works, you have to go for ECMO. I discussed already multiple times in the regular classes that what kind of ECMO will be effective for ARDS? VV ECMO. Isn't it? V ECMO will not be effective for ARDS. I mean, V ECMO is not required for ARDS. What is written in fifth is pulmonary vasodilators. Have you understood ARDS? I mean, these are the important points, right? Definition, what improves survival? What are the important steps in managing an ARDS patient? They ask you most common cause of ARDS, it is gram-negative sepsis. Sepsis. Sepsis is the most common cause of ARDS in the world right now. Okay. And what about respiratory failure? respiratory failure there are four types of respiratory failure right you have type 1 respiratory failure type 2 respiratory failure type 3 respiratory failure and type 4 respiratory failure type 1 respiratory failure is hypoxemic not hypoxic it's also got as hypoxemic respiratory failure where the problem is low pao2 and that would have resulted in low psao2 because of hypoxemia patient would have hyperventilated. Because of hyperventilation, PSEO2 would have been reduced, washed out, and that's typical of a type 1 respiratory failure. But if you look at type 2 respiratory failure, it is also called as hypercapnic or hypercarbic respiratory failure. Here the main problem is low PSEO2. Sorry, increase PSEO2. This is the main problem. That is reflexly stopping the oxygen to be low. So it's increased PSEO2. That is causing low PSEO2. So here the primary problem is going to be increased PSEO2. And this is typically due to hypoventilation. Avla hypoventilation. Is there a neuromuscular problem or due to some central nervous system cause like opioid poisoning or benzodiazepine poisoning that's the reason PSU2 is increasing and that is reflexly reducing the oxygen so this is type 2 respiratory failure type 3 respiratory failure occurs in a condition called post-operative arteriectasis type 4 type 4 respiratory failure is due to shock and cardiac arrest this shock will result in hypoperfusion to respiratory muscles and that hypoperfusion respiratory muscles will make them weak. And that is what is the mechanism behind type 4 respiratory failure. So these are the four classic types of respiratory failure. You have to find out the cause and address. ARDS is a typical example of a type 1 respiratory failure. Where the mechanism is shunt formation. If they ask you mechanism of ARDS, it's shunt formation. A typical finding of ARDS is the lung will be having very, very poor compliance. Lung will be extremely non-compliant. And it's also going to cause hypoxemia by a mechanism called as shunt formation. Okay. Understood or not? Yes or no? Yes, right? Okay. Now let us move on to ABG. What is the thing that is important for FMG? No need to go into detail. What is important for FMG? That's the only thing that I'm going to discuss right now. So for that, you need to look at the pH. You need to look at the bicarbonate. You need to look at PSEO2 and interpretation. Dr. Enthusiasm, what is telling? I don't know Hindi, man. Sorry. I really don't know Hindi. I don't know what you're saying. You're commenting something in Hindi. Okay. Okay, everything is fine, right? Because I don't know when they comment in Hindi, I don't know whether they're commenting about audiovisual aids or something else. That's the reason I was um, like little distracted with that. Okay, all good. Okay, fine. Let us move on. 
So pH, bicarbonate, PaCO2, and interpretation. So what is the average pH? 7.4. What is the average bicarbonate? 24. What is the average carbon dioxide? 40. So anything less than 7.4, I'm going to call it as acidosis. More than 7.4 alkalosis, just for calculation purpose. So pH low, bicarbonate low, carbon dioxide low, metabolic acidosis. All arrows go in the same direction. Increased, this must be metabolic alkalosis. pH low, bicarbonate high, carbon dioxide high, this must be respiratory acidosis. pH high, bicarbonate low, carbon dioxide low, it must be respiratory alkalosis. That's it. But in reality, it's only up to you to know which is correlating with what. For example, low pH, that is acidosis, must correlate with low bicarbonate only. Why? Because only low bicarbonate can produce acidosis. If it's low carbon dioxide, that's the primary, it should actually produce alkalosis, not acidosis. So this must be primary and this must be compensated. And similarly, this is alkalosis. This is alkalosis. And only increased bicarbonate can produce alkalosis. Increased carbon dioxide, if it's primary, should have produced acidosis only. So I can conclude this must be what? Compensatory. So you can notice that the compensation is very simple. In metabolic acidosis, the compensation is hyperventilation. Hyperventilation. In metabolic alkalosis, the compensation is hypoventilation. This is the actual compensation that's occurring. In metabolic acidosis, compensation is hyperventilation. And that may lead to Kussmaul's kind breathing in DK, where the breathing will be hard and labored. And in metabolic alkalosis, the compensation will be hypoventilation, not hyperventilation. And in respiratory acidosis, what, what is happening here? Here the pH is acidotic, but what correlates the pH is the high carbon dioxide. Only that can produce acidosis. If high bicarbonate was the primary event, that should have produced alkalosis only. So I can conclude that this must be compensatory. Similarly, increased pH means it is alkalosis. And only low carbon dioxide can produce alkalosis. If low bicarbonate was the primary issue, it should have produced acidosis only. So I can take this as a primary and this low bicarbonate as a compensatory response. So basically what's happening is renal compensation. Then respiratory acidosis compensation is bicarbonate retention. In respiratory alkalosis, there is increased urinary bicarbonate because there must be bicarbonate wasting to reduce the bicarbonate. So the kidneys will take care of that. So they are going to change the bicarbonate and thereby act as a compensatory response. Okay, so far so good. Understood? Whatever I told you, how to find out the primary disorder. So now you know, right? So what is the compensation? So what is the primary? And what is the compensatory response? Clear? So what else you should know at a FMG level? So once you know how to interpret at a, this level, next step is to find out metabolic acidosis and its causes. And one more important thing is, I've told you so many times in my classes that these arrows always move in same direction, right? They always move in the same direction. Arrows move in the same direction. You can notice. Arrows always move in the same direction. In case if the arrows move in opposite directions, what does that mean? It's always a mixed disorder. Suppose bicarbonate and PaCO2 arrows in the opposite direction, like this or like this. Opposite direction. Whenever the arrows move in opposite direction, this must be 100% mixed disorder. This must be 100% mixed disorder. 100% mixed, there is no way that this can happen. Whenever arrows are moving in the opposite direction, it is a mixed disorder unless put other place. That's it. We have discussed so many times. Acidosis. Whenever you are dealing with a case of metabolic acidosis, what they're going to ask? They're going to ask you to find out anion gap. What about anion gap? Anion gap is nothing but what? Sodium minus bicarbonate and chloride. Sodium and bicarbonate and chloride. This is the formula for anion gap. 
if the anion gap is less than 12. It is a normal anion gap metabolic acidosis. The anion gap is more than equal to 12. It's a high anion gap metabolic acidosis. What are the two important causes of uh, nagma? Two important causes. The mnemonic for remembering nagma is doctor, DR. Okay. So that's the most important cause of nagma. So D stands for diarrhea and other GA causes. R stands for renal tubular acidosis. This can be a type 1 RTA, type 2 RTA or a type 4 RTA. This can be a type 1, type 2 or a type 4. So type 1 and type 2 RTA will have hypokalemia. Type 4 RTA patients will be having hyperkalemia. And G diarrhea patients also will be having what? Hypo or hyperkalemia, any GA cause. Diarrhea patients also will be having hypo or hyperkalemia, diarrhea. When you uh, lose tools, you are going to lose potassium in the tools, right? So you are going to have hypokalemia only. So diarrhea also is going to produce hypokalemia. So among all these causes, the only thing that causes hyperkalemia is this type 4 RTA. Type 4 RTA. So what is type 1 RTA? It is distal RTA. So what will tell you that you are dealing with the distal RTA? One, nephrocalcinosis, stone formation. That is nephrocalcinosis. Second one, if the patient is having increased urinary calcium and low urinary citrate. Hypercalciuria and hypocitraturia. So stones are there means that is distal RTA. In, how will you find out it's a proximal RTA? Type 2 is proximal renal tubular acidosis. How will you find out it's a proximal RTA? Patients will have bicarbonate urea. Increased urinary bicarbonate. Second is Fanconi syndrome. Fanconi syndrome. So what is the triad of Fanconi syndrome? You are going to have glycosuria, aminoacidurea, and phosphorus in the urine. Increase phosphorus excretion in the urine and increase amino acid excretion in the urine. So this triad of glycosuria, amino aciduria, and phosphaturia is what we call it as Fanconi syndrome. And because of this phosphaturia, Fanconi syndrome patients tend to have bone problems also. Fanconi syndrome patients tend to have bone problems like rickets and osteomalacia. Rickets in childhood, but osteomalacia in adults. They are going to have rickets and osteomalacia. These are bone problems that tend to occur in patients with Fanconi syndrome. So this is how you are going to difference between type 1, type 2 and type 4 RTA. Type 4 RTA is due to either aldosterone deficiency or it's going to be aldosterone resistance. That is for type 4 RTA. Aldosterone deficiency, aldosterone resistance. Most common cause of type 4 RTA will be drugs. For example, what are the drugs that cause aldosterone deficiency? NSAIDs. By blocking plastocycline synthesis, they will also block renin production. So that can produce aldosterone deficiency. And AC inhibitors, ARBs, all this stuff can produce Aldosterone deficiency. What are the th things that are going to produce aldosterone resistance? The most important is potassium sparing diuretics. Potassium sparing diuretics, which can be divided into mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists, and we have ENAC blockers. Potassium uh, MRIs are nothing but spinalactone and epilinone. ENAC blockers are nothing but amyloid and triamine. And apart from that, you can see calcineurin inhibitors also. What are calcineurin inhibitors? We have cyclosporin and tacrolimus. These are the basic ENAC blockers. Sorry, these are the basic drugs that in, come under calcium inhibitors that are going to induce aldosterone resistance by damaging the principal cells. So, aldosterone deficiency and aldosterone resistance, these are the usual reasons for type 4 RT. That is type 4 renal tubular acidosis. Apart from that, if you want to know other causes of NAGMA, not very important, commonly asked, that's chloride excess. Any Anytime when chloride comes into the body too much, you are going to result in hyperchloremic, normal and gap metabolic acidosis only. And second is ureterosigmoidostomy. Ureteros. Ureteric diversion or ureterosigmoidostomy. Or we can simply write as ureteric diversion. Especially to the segment code. If you re-implant the ureter into the sigma and code, that's called ureterosigmodism. These are other causes, but not important. Whereas the pneumonic is simply doctor, diarrhea, renal tubular astosis. These are the only two causes of NAGMA. Have you understood this?
have you understood yes that's all so what about hagma hagma we have a mnemonic right that's called gold mark gold mark hagma mnemonic is gold mark g stands for what glycols ethylene glycol propylene glycol and all those things o stands for oxoproline metabolite that is eliminated in paracetamol poisoning and l stands for l lactic acidosis l lactic acidosis d stands for d lactic acidosis and m stands for methanol a stands for aspirin that is salicylate poisoning r stands for renal failure and finally k stands for... okay so there are only three causes of ketose doses right so what are the three important causes of ketose doses alcohol starvation and decay that's it three causes of ketose doses alcohol starvation dk alcohol starvation dk alcohol starvation dk so these are essentially the cause of agma and if you look at whatever the fmg paper it may be most of the questions will be revolving around this table okay how to find out the disorder or they will be discussing about the anion cap calculation and agma and agma causes that's it so you can look at whatever fmg paper if you want in the last two three years this is the question they are asking nothing else in mbg yeah, they only ask interpretation. That's all. Okay. So what is the primary disorder? Find out the disorder in this patient. So this patient is having a pH of 7.1. So we are dealing with acidosis. Bicarbonate is low. PaCO2 is also low. So because bicarbonate is low, it must be metabolic acidosis. Because low PaCO2, will not be acting as a, uh, I mean, primary disorder. Why? Because if low PSE2 is the primary disorder, it should have caused alkalosis, not acidosis. So I can conclude that this low PSE2 must be a compensatory response. It must be compensation. And another rule is base excess rule. In case if you get an exam, you can use that. So you can look at the base excess also. Remember, as per the base excess rule, if the base excess is less than minus 2, it's metabolic acidosis. If it's more than plus 2, it's metabolic alkalosis. This is actually a quite an important rule. This is called as base excess rule. Less than minus 2, metabolic acidosis. Less than more than plus 2, metabolic alkalosis. And calculate the anion gap here. What is the anion gap? Anion gap is... 146 minus 120 plus by comment is 11. So anion gap is going to be 15 in this case. So this patient is having a high anion gap metabolic acidosis and the likely cause is lactic acidosis. The likely cause of high anion gap metabolic acidosis is lactic acidosis. That's the reason. Because patient is having evidence of circulatory failure and shock is requiring noradrenaline. That's it. Shall we move on? Yes, right? So whatever is essential, we discuss that. So I think it's enough. Now coming to certain topics on toxicology. So another important area. First is acetaminophen, APAP, parastamol. Parastamol is going to affect the liver. In the liver, it's going to result in centrilobular necrosis. Centrilobular necrosis. Okay. That is because of formation of a toxic product as called as NAPKI. That is N-acetyl parabenzoquinone. Antidote for uh, parasomal poisoning is N-acetyl system. Digoxin toxicity. Digoxin toxicity tend to produce a lot of problems. Like for example, earlier problem is nausea, vomiting. Slowly, they will start producing that characteristic yellowish vision that's called as xanthopsia. And 
they can also produce arrhythmias arrhythmias digoxin can produce both bradi as well as tachyarrhythmias bradi and tachyarrhythmias the antidote of choice is going to be digibi plus or minus they can have hyperkalemia digoxin also commonly tend to produce hyperkalemia it's true that hyperkalemia is the side effect of digoxin toxicity but you need to know that hypokalemia worsens digoxin toxicity worsens digoxin toxicity so it's a very important point that hypokalemia worsens digoxin toxicity but the side effect of digoxin toxicity is hyperkalemia and what is the emergency antidote that you can give for bradi the patient is having severe bradi then emergency will be atropine if digivent is not available and you are in emergency give atropine if the pain is having ventricular arrhythmias like ventricular tachycardia better drug will be lignocaine 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 will be a better drug in case the pain is having ventricular arrhythmias beta blockers and ccbs how they are going to present they are going to present with hypotension bradycardia and acute heart failure that is pulmonary edema antidote of choice will be glucagon tricyclic antidepressants how tricyclic antidepressants are going to present they are going to present with wide qrs complex right axis deviation and ventricular arrhythmias wide qrs right axis deviation ventricular arrhythmias plus or minus they can also have hyperthermia and delirium because they are having anticholinergic like potential so like giving atropine they develop delirium and hyperthermia and antidote of choice for this is iv soda bicarbonate what about local anesthetics in exam they will give bupivac and toxicity and this will usually produce ventricular arrhythmias for local anesthetic toxicity in exam antidote of choice is 20% iv intralipid 20% iv intralipid or we can call them as lipid emulsification lipid emulsification opiates and benzodiazepines will have common features right why hyperkalemia and digoxin toxicity no no because digoxin blocks the sodium potassium atps it prevents the movement of potassium into the cell so that's where you see hyperkalemia in fact some people call that hyperkalemia to be protective because that hyperkalemia prevents further digoxin from binding with sodium potassium atps by competition that's the that is another reason why hypokalemia is dangerous in the setting of digoxin toxicity because if you have hypokalemia more digoxin will bind to potassium binding sites which is the basic binding site of digoxin so if you have opioids or benzodiazepine toxicity the main problem will be hypothermia low gcs low respiratory rate this is a typical finding patient will be in coma respiratory rate will be low temperature will be low the one difference between them is opioid patients will have pinpoint pupils constricted pupils and the antidote of choice for opioid poisoning is iv naloxone for benzodiazepines it is iv flumazine but giving flumazine is controversial because it's very very short acting and it can provoke seizures also so you have to be careful iron remember iron is kind of toxic only in oral form iv iron is not very toxic so oral iron is the one that's going to be extremely toxic and toxic dose if they ask you more than 60 mg per kg more than 60 mg per kg is a toxic dose no no opi toxicity means naloxone that's all you cannot think of anything else apart from naloxone okay more than 60 mg per kg is the toxic dose so it can affect the heart lungs causing cardiopulmonary failure and it tends to affect the liver also the usual reason for death will be cardiopulmonary failure but slowly slowly they will affect the liver and they can produce liver failure also and uh, iron toxicity one late effect is there that is gastric outlet obstruction one late effect is gastric outlet obstruction go gastric outlet obstruction and antidote will be iv defloxacin iv defloxacin or some people will call it as desferoxamine also 
it's all up to you and ethylene glycol and methanol they're going to cause low gcs because they are alcohols and uh, in india methanol poisoning is due to consumption of illicit liquid in exam there will be a strong clue if it's a methanol poisoning the examiner will 100% give intake of illicit liquor okay ethylene glycol is due to um drinking something called as antifreeze that's in western countries anyway low gcs blindness which is very common in methanol poisoning blindness and they can develop acute kidney injury ak is due to ethylene glycol predominantly and this is going to cause something called as calcium oxalate formation there will be massive surge of calcium oxalate monohydrate crystal formation in ethylene glycol poisoning that's where you get ak and treatment of antidote of choice will be iv fomipizole iv fomipizole if you don't have fomipizole then iv ethanol will be the alternative drug so we have opc poisoning typically dumbbells secretions everywhere diarrhea urination meiosis bronchorrhea bradycardia emesis lacrimation and salivation secretions everywhere you are going to give iv atropine plus pyridoxal standard antidote is atropine and pyridoxal then dystonia oclogaric crisis is a extra pyridoxal toxicity usually it will occur after usage of some dopamine receptor blocker especially a dd receptor blocker typically metoclopramide characteristically metoclopramide this is what the history that will be given typically metoclopramide so some anticholinergic drug will be the treatment of choice so you can use either benzexol that is trixyphenidyl benzexol or you can use promethazine iv promethazine which is also available in the form of drug called as stemetil okay promethazine so benzexol or promethazine other name for benzexol is trihexyphenidyl and the next five toxidromes sympathomimetic anticholinergic serotonin neuromuscular mal ne neuroleptic malignant syndrome malignant hyperthermia all of them will have fever high temperature common and all of them will have tachycardia hypertension okay and uh, tachypnea so they'll have common they can have hypertension tachycardia tachypnea okay so that can be common between all five toxidromes and that's why because temperature increase is common in all of them it is called as hyperthermic toxidromes so i can put in red they are also called as what hyperthermic toxidromes and they will also tend to have low gcs altered mental status plus or minus all of them also can have altered mental status and how your sympathomimic toxidrome will present so usually there will be history of cocaine or mdma use cocaine or mdma use and uh, another important clue will be the fact that systolic bp will be very very high even though bp increase can be seen in all of these toxidromes but here the systolic bp rise is going to be tremendous and treatment will be alpha blocker typically what we are going to use is iv fentolimine or if you want you can use um prazosin or even phenoxybenzamin but first you have to give alpha blockers only then later on you can give beta blockers if you want but first is always alpha blockers an anticholinergic toxidrome the clue will be datura in exam most of the times the clue will be datura poisoning and what will be the anticholinergic toxidrome patient will be dry in all other hypothermic toxidrome patient will be sweating but this is the only condition where the patient will be dry and they will be extremely delirious delirious extremely delirious and they tend to have severe hyperthermia also even though that's not very important the delirium too much of delirium with a dry patient is going to be a clincher for anticholinergic toxidrome and the treatment will be physosigmine treatment is physosigmine and what about serotonin syndrome 
here there will be history of use of SSRI or SNRI. Patient will be either using SSRI or patient will be using SNRI. SNRI. Okay. If you have serotonin syndrome, what is the most important finding? Diarrhea. Patients will be having diarrhea. Then Rigidity. Rigidity, where lower limb rigidity will be more than upper limb rigidity and patients will have exaggerated deep brain reflexes plus or minus clonus. Whenever you see a patient with rigidity and clonus under toxin intake, it is serotonin syndrome unless put otherwise. Treatment, ciproheptidin. Then we have neuroleptic malignant syndrome. Here again, there will be history of D2 receptor blocker use. There will be history of dopamine receptor blocker like metoclopramide or haloperidol. And these patients also will be rigid. But lower limb rigidity will be equal to upper limb rigidity. And patients will be having what? Normal or reduced DTS. DTS will not be exaggerated. They will have reduced or normal dependent reflexes only. This is very, very important. And this rigidity is more of a catatonic rigidity. It will be like catatonia like rigidity and the deep brain reflex will be normal or suppressed. And what is the treatment? It is bromocryptin, dopamine receptor agonist plus dantrolin IV to reduce the muscle contractions. This is a standard indication, a standard therapy for patients who are having neuroleptic malignant syndrome. And malignant hyperthermia, usually the clue will be succinyl colon use. I have seen a lot of patients with cold induced malignant hyperthermia. And it's an autosomal dominant condition due to rhinodin receptor mutation. It's an autosomal dominant condition with rhinodin receptor mutation. Here also patient will be rigid, but there will be extreme rigidity. It will be rigor mortis like rigidity. According to textbooks, this rigidity is so extreme that they're going to have rigor mortis like rigidity. And patients will have extreme hyperthermia. Extreme hyperthermia. Like core body temperature can reach 40 45 or even 46 degrees Celsius. I'll leave in some time. Core body temperature can reach even 40 or 45 degrees Celsius. And uh, another important clue will be sudden increase in ETCO2 in waveform capnography. Sudden increase in ETCO2 in the operation theater. So another very, very standard clue. Sudden increments in ETCO2 because of excessive carbon dioxide generation by the hypercontracting muscle. And treatment of choice is dantrolin. And then we have methemoglobinemia and carboxyhemoglobinemia, which is basically hemoglobin problems. Hemoglobin problems, so they're going to produce anemic hypoxia. And cyanide poisoning will prevent the cells from utilizing oxygen, so it's going to produce histotoxic hypoxia. So it's not a hemoglobin problem. It's going to produce histotoxic hypoxia. So, methemoglobinemia and carboxyhemoglobinemia, they are going to produce anemic hypoxia. Cyanide, on the other hand, is going to produce histotoxic hypoxia. So, when will you suspect methemoglobinemia drugs like dapsone, nitrates, and probably local anesthetics like prilocaine and benzocaine? In that, this dapsone is important because they might give history of patient who's on treatment for leprosy, they might give nitrates where they may give history of a patient who is on treatment for chronic stable angina, where they regularly use nitrates. And low anesthetics like prilocaine and benzocaine. They can also produce methemoglobinemia. And treatment of choices, IV, methylene blue. Antidote of choices, IV, methylene blue. And how they are going to present? They are going to present chocolate colored discoloration of blood. That's called chocolate blood. They will have chocolate colored discoloration of blood. That's a very important point. Brownish hue will be there because of formation of methemoglobin. And uh, carboxyhemoglobin may have to suspect in fires and in automobile exhaust, overexposure to automobile exhaust.
and here the clue will be cherry red discoloration of the blood correct the body and the blood everything will show cherry red discoloration antidote of choice hyperbaric oxygen therapy hbot and cyanide poisoning again the clue will be fires but it's a uh, diagnosis of suspicion and uh, there will be spell of bitter almonds the clue will be smell of bitter almonds so that's why you need to know three th these three words chocolate cherry almond chocolate cherry almond so with this indicates your methemoglobinemia carboxyhemoglobinemia and cyanide poisoning treatment of choices iv vitamin b12 that is hydroxocobalamin iv hydroxocobalamin alternative will be iv sodium thiosulfate but B12 itself is more than enough in most situations. And remember, in all these three conditions, the PaO2 will be normal, which means the partial pressure of arterial oxygen will be normal. It won't be reduced because this is not a problem of dissolved oxygen. The first two are a problem of hemoglobin. The last one is the problem of cells uptaking hemoglobin because they block the electron transport chain. So that's it. I've understood this. Whatever I told you, all the poisons, Yes, right? Okay, the important stuff about all the poisons. How to differentiate? Now, let us move on to environmental emergencies, but you want a lunch break, right? It's 2.10. Okay, so you can go and have your lunch and you can come back. We'll try to begin by 2.45, okay? 2.45, 2.50, I'll start during that time. You can come back. Happy soul is telling medicine seems more easy. This is the first time I'm hearing someone say that. After all the subjects, medicine seems more easy. Thank you so much. Actually, we covered a sizable amount of information Okay, in the three hours mark. No? So it's hardly like three, three and a half hours. We have done sizable amount of information. Let us try to finish as much as possible, as soon as possible. By 8.39, we'll try to finish. Okay. Bye-bye. Take care. We'll come back again at uh, 2.45, 2.50 by the time. Bye-bye.